The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning. Um, I invite again Commissioner Mason to perform the acknowledgement of country. The Disability Royal Commission acknowledges the First Nations people as the original inhabitants of the different lands on which this hearing is being held, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, Durable and Jagera Nations, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We pay respect, particularly to our elders with disability, past and present, and we give acknowledgement to First Nations young people with disability who one day would take their place as elders in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, Miss Bennett. Chair, this morning we're going to hear from Sharon and Alex about their son, Jack. You will find a statement of Alex at Tender Bundle A, Volume 1, Ab 1. In due course, I'll tender that statement and ask that it be marked Exhibit 7.116. The statement of Sharon is at Tender Bundle A, Volume 1, Tab 2, with some marked documents at Tabs 4, 9 and 18. And in due course, I'll tender that statement and ask that it be marked Exhibit 7.117 and the reference to material as 7.117.1 to 7.117.3. Uh, Chair, there's also a bundle of relevant material that I tender and ask to be marked as Exhibit 7.118 and 7.163. Um, Chair, before proceeding to ask that Sharon and Alex be sworn in, I would like it noted that this evidence may include references to suicide and self-harm and may be particularly distressing to some, we strongly encourage people to look after themselves and to put their safety first. If people wish to stop following the hearing for this section of the evidence, it is likely to take up to one hour and 20 minutes, which will then be followed by a 20 minute break. The next session is scheduled to commence at 11.40 a.m. Queensland time. And of course, if anyone needs to speak to someone about the issues raised, they can contact the National Counselling and Referral Service on 1800 421 Lifeline on 1311 14, or Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636. Um, so, Chair, those being the matters, I'd ask that Sharon and Alex be called. Yes, thank you. Um, Sharon and Alex, if I may refer to you in that way. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence today to the Royal Commission. We appreciate your attendance. Uh, if you wouldn't mind following the instructions of Commissioner Atkinson's associate, uh, who will administer the affirmation to you. Thank you. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please both say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I think you're probably on mute still, are you? Yes. I do. Is that better? <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Ms Bennett uh, will now ask you some questions, and hopefully we will be able to hear your answers. Before we do that, Chair, I might ask that um, Alex be sworn in as well. Or perhaps I missed Alex's response. Yes. Alex, did it's okay. here yep. for, you, you acknowledge the affirmation, I think. Yes, yes I do. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Alex. All right, uh, Sharon, you have made a 17-page statement to this Royal Commission dated 25 February 2020, is that right? And Alex, you have made a 13-page statement dated 29 August 2020, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And are the contents of those statements true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. All right. Um, well, Sharon, can you tell us something about your family? Um, Alex and I have been married for 28 years. We have three sons, um, Christopher's 27, 
Ben's 24 and Jack is 19 next week, actually. Um, we have two granddaughters and a new little bub that's due tomorrow, actually, a new little grandson, which is just lovely. Um, we're very close. Yeah, we're all, we're all up here in town, so all together. So, well, different houses, but yeah. Thank you. And um, we're here today to talk about your son, Jack, in large part. I understand you received a text message from him this morning. Would you like to read out what he wanted you to say to the Commission? Uh, yes, he sent me this text message when he was hiding in his room. Um, you and Dad, don't be too nervous. You're there fighting for me and I'm too unwell to go. You're there to let people know I've been wronged and that it's ruined me. And also let everyone in the Commission um, know that I say hi and thank you for the opportunity to help others and make something of myself. Um, and if you can't say that, that's okay. Well, thank yeah. you for saying that, Sharon, and pass on our thanks to Jack for talking to us in that way. And, um, and, from, and from the commissioners as well. Um, tell us about Jack. What was he like as a kid? Jack was really full on as a kid, very inquisitive, um, very busy. Um, a full on daredevil. Yeah. He's the one that always had to get on the scooters, jump jumps, hurt himself all the time, climb fences, trees, always outside. A typical, a typical boy, yeah. Typical boy. Was he similar to your other sons? Jack was a lot busier than the other two, um, and it was also a lot of little quirks that we noticed about Jack that were very different to the other two boys. Um, probably from the age of two that we noticed he was a terrible sleeper. He was picky with eating. He was picky with what clothes he wore. Um, yeah, very, very demanding. He used to do a lot of things like bite and pinch and just, you know, somersault on the couch for no reason. And we kind of, yeah, we thought that, and he'd do a lot of those things and we'd go, oh, like, that's just Jack. You know, that's just what Jack does. He's just a little bit quirky. And we didn't sort of think too much of it at, at that age. Yeah, when he was really young. Now, education is fairly important to your family, is that right? Definitely. Alex, Definitely. can you tell us about your experience of education? Um, I had a hard life through foster care and stuff. I moved around a lot, um, no fault of my own, it's just parents. Uh, they were divorced at a young age and I went to like 56 primary schools. So education to me was major. Um, as for Sharon, um, my goal was I wanted my kids to go to one school and then that high school and that was it. And pretty much the oldest boys have done that. But then, you know, that's the sort of life that I wanted from to give them a chance. Um, I didn't learn to read and write until maybe 23 and Sharon taught me how to do that. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty tough times and I never wanted any of my kids to go through what I have to go through yet. And so you... You sent your sons to what I'll call the first primary school and uh, and they had a good experience there, the elder two sons, is that right? Yes. Sports, everyone, they were just normal kids. And, and when it came Jack's time to go to that school, they were taught by the same teacher that had taught your older sons, is that right? Sorry, we lost the audio the same teacher um, in her last year of teaching before retirement. So she was delighted to get the last of our children. Um, we trusted her, lovely teacher. Um, so yeah, so it started off really well. I'd like to, if I could, just hear from, hear Jack's voice about that start of, to school and ask the operator to play IND.0004.0002.0001 .0005. And Alex, I should say, this is a recording that you took with Jack and when you were talking to him about his life, is that right? Yeah, myself and one of his carers. Um, yeah. Jack didn't want to be put on camera, so we sat there for a little while and I just asked random questions about his life and schooling and this is what's happened. And, and he's content for us to play these clips today. Ah, oh, definitely, yes. Yeah, right. Well, if, if the operator could play that clip, that would be great.
All right. Um, did, was, was Jack assessed in that year? Can you tell the commissioners about that? Um, Also, uh, you know, not sitting on his bottom in the class. He was struggling with learning to write. And she suggested that perhaps we get him assessed. We did have a person from Child, Youth and Mental Health come to our home, uh, watched Jack play on the floor for about an hour, said he was fine, and that was the end of, end of the assessment, I guess, and nothing further was done. Okay, and so he progressed to the next, um, well, he repeated that year of primary school again, is that right? I'm sorry, Sharon, I'm going to pause you there because we're having difficulty hearing you. I think you'll need to lean forward and speak up. I'm sorry. Teacher suggested that he repeat. Um, purely because of the challenges that he was facing um, and strongly recommended that he stay down and repeat the year. And he had a new teacher this time? That wasn't quite so tolerant of Jack. Um, he was put up at the back of the class a lot, um, put next to another young boy in the class that had a disability. Uh, left out a lot of the activities. Um, we constantly got into trouble. She said he rocked on his chair, he made noises, he wouldn't sit still. Um, so we had a lot of visits up to the office during that year. Um, Alex in particular went up and spoke to the principal of the school um, when he noticed some discrepancies, I guess, in the photos of that were taken of um, activities that were done in the class. Alex, can you tell us about that? Basically, I started noticing when um, Jack would go into the classroom and we'd put his lunchbox in the fridge. Now, it sounds silly, but he would look at the teacher to be recognised, to say hello, and she'd pretty much turn around her back and talk to some other child. And to me, that was like a flag that's the first thing that I noticed. Um, and then going back through the photos of the Father's Day, the Easter photos and all the different things that they do in a classroom, Jack was actually, I went through the photos and I saw that Jack was put up the back with another child. And they were always up the back, these two boys. They were never in the circle. Um, so I confronted the principal. And so then we had a meeting with the teacher and the vice principal at the same time as well. And he told me then that his staff don't do that sort of thing to children. But it wasn't until I showed him the photos, please explain the photos. And then he sort of said to me, okay, I'll deal with it. Okay. And nothing had changed from that. Yeah, and, I could see. And so far as you saw, how was, the school responding to Jack's behaviour at this stage? Did um, they see him as a naughty kid or did they see him as quirky or how did they, how do you think they saw him? Um, it was basically pushed back to us as we weren't disciplining him enough um, and was all, it was all called bad behaviour. He was basically targeted as a naughty child um, that we didn't discipline correctly. So sort of all came back on our shoulders to go, well, you need to do something about your son because he's just a naughty little boy. But I could right. add to that? Yes. When we say this, that we had a, uh, our middle child in the same school at that stage and Jack would be ready for school at 7 o'clock in the morning, even though he's been treated like this, he was keen to attend at that stage. Because he had friends. He had friends and he's, he'd be in, trying to get in the car at 7 in the morning. So it just shows you the difference, you know, he didn't understand what was happening to him. Well, again, let, let's hear from Jack about this time. If the operator could find clip IND.0004.0002.0001, uh, we could hear from Jack around this time of his um, primary school career.
So at this stage, is there any learning plan in place for, for Jack? No. no nothing. He wasn't treated any differently to the rest of the class. It was just the fact that, you know, he was naughty in their eyes. Yeah. And I think that the next year, I think in your statement, you say that Jack's teacher engaged well with him. Is that fair? Yes. That is fair to say. Um, Jack was still very popular in that year and had a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. um, we had quite a few meetings that year um, regarding Jack's bad behaviour again. Um, during all that, we're still taking him to doctors, to, to a paediatrician. Um, I remember that year we took him to a paediatrician. He sort of measured his height and weight and then told me to take him home and give him a good flogging, um, which clearly we didn't do. Um, yeah, but we really sort of got no suggestions from the school leader on how to help him. You know, we'd get yeah, we, brought into the meetings and told he's naughty and sort of nothing more than that. There was no sort of offer of any information on what we could do, or how they could support him further or um, anything like that. And we're getting called to the school to pick him up sometimes at this stage? I started headbutting butting -esque. All right, well, again, we can... Sorry, Sharon, please finish what you were saying. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. It's just that he started the self-harming at a very young age, so we had to go to the school quite a bit, yes. All right, well, let's let, hear from Jack about this time in his life. Uh, this operator is at ind.0004.0002.1. Now, Sharon and Alex, I'd like to talk to you now about the following year. This is the year that Jack was diagnosed. Um, can you tell us about how that year was for you and your family? At home, it was really difficult. Um, his behaviour was worsening. Um, 
you know, he'd have meltdowns. He was quite violent, quite destructive. Um, he was smashing up our house. Um, he was going to the point where he was in school refusal, so he just didn't want to go um, at all. So that was a really, really tough year. Um, and that was the year that the teacher finally agreed that there was something um, about Jack that needed to be investigated further. Um, and they referred us to Child, Youth and Mental Health for an assessment. And, and tell us, tell the commissioners about that assessment. They went through about 12 months of assessments. So they did the Connors, um, sensory seeking and sensory sensitivity kind of assessments, all these assessments we'd never heard of. And they also told us that we needed to do nine weeks of parenting classes. Um, and they said if we didn't do the, the parenting classes, then we wouldn't get any support at the Child, Youth and Mental Health Centre either. So, um, and it was very, it was a very stressful time. We had, um, you know, two other boys at home dealing with this at the same time that we were trying to find out what was wrong with Jack, which for any parent to find out that there's something wrong with your child is a really difficult time to deal with because you've got to go through the process of finding it out and then learning about it and then getting angry and then grieving and you know and you never really kind of accept it and you always keep working on the hope that maybe one day that he's going to be okay um even now we kind of hope that there's still a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel which is probably not realistic um yeah. and at the end of those assessments he was diagnosed with Tourette's is that right taken him into a room with a psychiatrist who told me to give Jack the best life possible um, so when he grows up he doesn't go to jail which quite distressed me because I'm like we're good honest people we don't have anything to do with the police and why would she think my I think it was eight nine year old child would end up in jail which was quite a bit of a strong statement I thought yeah and I could add to that too please that um, when you did drop Jack at school, he would, you'd actually have to physically pull him out of the car and he'd be screaming and punching and kicking. And every other child, you see him out the front watching this. That's just not normal, you know? And, and then he'd be sobbing and you'd actually have to leave him or walk into a classroom, um, crying still. And you'd have to leave him there and, I mean, even I drive back, start driving down the road with tears in my eyes because it was just horrible. And they call and, it and tough love. Yeah, tough love to follow the law and get your child to go to school. So. Yeah. And only two years earlier, he was up at 7am and sitting yep. at the door with his bag. Yeah. Um, so you, you got some information from the Tourette's Association of Australia, is that right? Yes, I did what any mother would do and researched and researched. Um, they were lovely. They sent me an education pack to give to the school, also information pack for us. Um, so I went to the school, handed over the education pack, explained the diagnosis to them and said, this is all the information that you need that can help, that you can learn about Tourette's. Um, it's got in here how the best way to teach a child with Tourette's and what not to do. Um, and they pretty much dismissed the diagnosis, telling me Tourette's is not a disability. It doesn't fit in the top six disabilities, which at that time I didn't know there were a top six. Um, I didn't realise there was like some sort of competition going on with that. Um, and strongly suggested that we take back Jack, uh, take Jack back to the doctors and get him diagnosed with autism as well because then they would give us the funding for a teacher's aid and then they would help us. Right. Did anyone explain to you why an autism diagnosis would help? Jack, in the teacher's eyes, um, Jack exhibited traits of autism um, and I think my sarcastic response is I didn't know that you're a clinical person so how can you determine that about my child? Um, and so you, you tried to get, did you try and get a diagnosis for him, an autism diagnosis for him? Um, we took that back to our paediatrician who wasn't satisfied with just the Tourette's. 
She'd also diagnosed him with comorbidities such as depression and anxiety um, and a learning disorder. Um, and then she then suggested um, that we go to a clinical psychologist for a full clinical assessment, which we did. Um, and at the end of that, she did diagnose Jack with traits of Asperger's syndrome, but still did not put him on the ASD or tick that box that the school wanted, wanted um, us to tick because she, you know, clinically she just couldn't say he had full-blown autism. Um, and I remember being really angry with her because I felt like that she'd taken away the last chance we had to get Jack help at school. But at the same time, I was relieved because I did want him to have yet another label. Um, and so how did you feel when you felt that you couldn't tick that box? How did that feel for you and, and, and for Alex? else to go to be honest we didn't know what else to do um we kind of felt really really lost you know and and and, and during all of this our child's still you know going nuts at home going nuts at school and then we sort of had no more sort of ideas on, on what to do then and how are you paying for these assessments um we paid for them privately so out of our own money um alex ended up having to go and get a um, job that paid more money just so we could simply keep Jack in therapy and in in treatment and so forth. So and Alex, like, uh, with um, like just say you go to one doctor and it's three and a half thousand dollars just for a letter. You know, it's fifteen hundred dollars to another doctor. Um, so I left a good job. I was there for about eight years, and I had to chase bigger money. Um, and now I drive up and down the highway, the Bruce Highway, um, and I had to stay away and sleep in the truck there through the week. And that was really tough. That was a tough time for the whole family. Um, not only on Jack, Sharon and the other two boys had to step up and the other two boys had to step up and sort of be a dad sort of thing as well when I wasn't there. Um, when I did come home on weekends, you know, you've got bombarded by the two boys, the other two boys and Sharon, um, that, you know, you're the dad, not me. That's what one of the boys said to me once. Um, and you're still trying to do the sport with those guys and just the amount of money that was, like the medicines Jack would be on there, like you go to the psychiatrist, that'd be twice a week and that's $400 a week. You just can't do these things with that. Yeah, we'd lose the house otherwise as well. And so, um, did Jack keep getting in trouble at school? Yeah, for sure. That was a constant. That never ended. Um, I remember also. I went. We're kind of really desperate on what to do with Jack, and then I heard that a specialist in Tourette's was coming to Townsville. Um, for a Parkinson's information session and a deep brain stimulation session. So I actually went to that just so I could meet this professor and um, ask him for help because we didn't know what, what else we could do. We weren't getting any help from the school. We weren't getting any help from doctors. So then we went to, I went to this session and at the half time break, I went up to the professor and said, can you please help me? We have a son with Tourette's Plus, um, we're losing him. Um, what what can you what can you offer that we can do further to help him? Um, and he was very lovely. He gave me the name of a specialist down in Brisbane, a psychiatrist um, that specialises in Tourette syndrome. So we finally sort of thought that we'd found something that might make his life a little bit easier. Now Jack uh, Jack's Tourette's he, he sometimes has tics, doesn't he? And um, how? How is the school responding to him having those ticks through the day? Well, I, I know one case there that um, he said, said mongrel, there was one of these ticks that he said, you know, for a few weeks there, um, and they can't stop saying it. And one of the teachers heard him say that and she grabbed him and by the ear and dragged him up, the up to the principal's office by his ear in front of all the children at lunchtime and 
just things like that happen pretty often. They put him in the naughty board uh, corner, like as a kid, um, but they didn't want to look into that he had a disability. He was just like just a naughty kid all the time. That's what they saw, you know. Well, again, but he just didn't stop. Sorry, sorry, Alex, I didn't mean to. I said, I yeah, he just didn't stop. Yeah. Now she suggested once that he should learn. He needed to learn how to control his Tourette's in public, um, which I found quite yeah. I'm not very happy when I heard that. It's like telling a child not to sneeze. Well, we've got a, a clip from Jack from around this time. Uh, that's at ind.0004.0002.0001. Before we play, Sharon, I'm just getting a note to ask if you could um, pause and lean forward before answering because there's often a delay in the audio feed coming through. Thank you. And your operator, could you please play that clip? Um, all right, well, let's, let's talk about the following year. I think Jack really liked his teacher the following year in grade four. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, that was the young teacher. Um, very, very young teacher straight out of university. Um, and, and at that, that time, you were still trying... I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, sorry, sorry, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong teacher. <laughs> um, so that year, he had an amazing teacher. Yep. So, apologies for my error. Um, he did everything she could to make Jack's life easier. She developed special little um, tools in the classroom to, to help him with his work. I do remember that she used to print out the work in dot to dot form. So instead of Jack having to write or copy off the board, he'd just trace over the letters. Um, and he, he really, really liked that. He did everything he could to, yeah. And when we, when we used to drop Jack off at school in the morning and he'd be screaming and kicking, this particular teacher would come to school earlier so she could be there in the car park and we'd drop Jack right next to her car. So she'd walk in with Jack. And yeah. just little things like that made her absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And you were still uh, getting assistance from different doctors and specialists to try and help Jack around this time, is that right? Jack um, was continuing, once we had the assessment done with um, clinical psychologist, Jack continued to see her every week for therapy. Um, and also, we've got to remember that he, he was going through so much medication. Doctors didn't understand Tourette's, because um, not very many do. And they, Jack's body was just full of different sorts of drugs to try and ease his anxiety, all different sort of things. So his mood to a change with that as well. So there was a lot of um, stuff going in his body too. And I think you say, Sharon, that you asked the school for an aid around this time, for a teacher's aid. Uh, how, how did the school respond to that? Um, like they always had responded, that Jack didn't fit the top six criteria. 
um, for disabilities and we weren't eligible. I know at one point I asked if I could pay for an aid out of our own pocket and they told me it didn't work like that. Um, they were very clear that the funding that the school got for teachers' aids was allocated to individual students that were already handpicked basically for the money. So, And that was that top six disabilities again, was it? That came up every time we asked for help. Okay. Um, now, the following year was another difficult year. Um, you introduced yourself early to Jack's teacher, Sharon. Can you tell us about how that went? Um, I met her on the very first day of school and sort of said to her, oh, you know, you'd know about my son. I'm sure they've explained that he's got some special needs and, you know, that you need to be aware of. Um, and she didn't. Um, she was very young, straight out of university. Um, very lovely young teacher, way out of her, de out of her depth. Um, I know that she tried really hard with Jack. I know she'd send me a lot of emails. They started a communication book. Um, but that year was probably on the really downward spiral um, with Jack. He was self-harming at school, um, trying, he, you know, broke a, razor, uh, broke a sharpener and tried to cut himself with the razor. He'd swallow piece, pieces of pencil and pieces of rubber to make himself sick to try and come home. She caught him trying to strangle himself with the computer cord um, underneath her desk. And he did spend an awful lot of time that year asleep under her desk because that was his safe place um, to be, so. Alex, how was that year for you? Yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, I, think, I think it's just frustrating, you know? I think in the end, uh, I can't remember if that's the right year or not, that he might have, they might have given him an iPad or, or a beanbag and just left him there all day, just, what was that further on? Sorry. No, I don't apologise. Yes, yeah, um, it's, but it's just the trauma you see your kid, your kid come through, you know, every day, yeah. Well, again, we've, we've got a recording from Jack about this time. This this recording we won't play publicly. It'll just be heard by those in the commission room. It's at ind.0004.0002.0013.
No, I think Alex and Sharon that it was around this time that Jack developed a whiplash tick. Can you tell the commissioners about that time? Uh, the whiplash tick involved Jack um, flicking his head back really, really fast and really far. You can't mimic it if you try. Um, and it was such a dangerous tick and it could have been life-threatening. Well, it was life-threatening. Um, he had, was at risk of either becoming paralysed or dying. So we had to take him down to Brisbane um, to his psychiatrist to get some urgent medical intervention. Um, so Dr Morton put him on a really strong antipsychotic drug that stopped the tick, um, um, but unfortunately it, Jack put on a lot of weight in a very short amount of time um, because of that. Um, yeah, so, so then the bullying and everything like that at school just increased terribly because now you've got a kid who has terrible anxiety, doesn't want to be at school, is learning nothing and now he's fat. So yeah, that, that was the beginning of the end really, wasn't it? Yeah. And that, and that wasn't food, that was the medication that put that weight on. His diet never changed. And she did say that that's what was the biggest side effect. May I just ask a question, if you don't mind, at this point? Um, you've explained, I think, that Jack didn't qualify for uh, teacher's aid and so forth because he didn't satisfy any one of the six criteria. Was that still the position at this stage? Yes. It was. That, that, had ne that had never changed. They Did didn't you know... Believe... Sorry. Did you know what the six criteria were at this stage? I remember... I probably... I know autism was definitely there. Um, blind, deaf, intellectually impaired... Disabled. I didn't mean to test your knowledge. I mean, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, that's pretty much all I remember, but I do know that Tourette's was definitely not on the list. Um, but what is on the list, what is on the list, at least from some other evidence, is speech language impairment, which, as I understand it, is often a characteristic of Tourette's syndrome. Was, was that ever explained to you? No, it never was, no. And we actually had a... Um, the guidance counsellor, we got in touch with those at school too, and they promised the world and nothing ever, there was no school plan, there was nothing ever come from it. Uh, and nobody ever suggested to you, and I don't, I don't know from my own knowledge what would have happened, but nobody suggested to you that one of those criteria might be filled because of the uh, category of speech language impairment. Uh, not no, once. never. Not never. once. Never, the first time I've heard about it is from you, basically. Thank you. Um, did you report Jack's concerns about bullying to the school? Yes, um, over and over. And, and how was the response to those concerns? Nothing was ever done. There was no, nothing was ever done with Jack. Um, I think by that stage he was just put in the too hard basket and left in the corner. And how was he reacting to school by this stage? Um, that he got more frightened um, of of the kids. He got it into his head that. You know, apart from them all thinking he was a freak already because of his Tourette's, he was now a fat freak. So that, that exacerbated his feelings of anxiety and depression. Um, and he was fearful to go to school. He just, he didn't want to be there at all. And I think, Sharon, you say in your statement that around this time he, he tried to harm himself. Is that right? Um, so... Jack tried to, I walked into his bedroom and he was on the bed with a coat hanger wrapped around his neck, um, he's purple. Um, so, of course, you know, I rushed over, took it off him, took him to the doctors. Um, there was only superficial bruising. And at that point, um, I just couldn't see him suffer anymore. So we made the decision to pull him out of school early 
um, so we could focus on his mental health because then we were just so afraid of him doing something like that again. Um, and by then I was that desperate and didn't know where to go or what to do that I ended up writing a letter um, to the Premier of Queensland um, and then I sort of, you know, or an email and I cc'd in everybody that I Googled because I didn't know anybody. Um, so, you know, that the Minister for Education and Minister for Disabilities, um, just whatever I could think of and, I, and all our local um, politicians um, and I just sent it all to everybody. And I said to my husband, if this doesn't do anything, then we'll have to go to the media because we have no other avenues to explore. And the media has always been the last, is always the last thing that we ever wanted to do to protect him, so. Um, but you did get a call from someone from the department. Uh, Leslie Theodore got in touch, is that right? That's correct. Um, one of the loveliest ladies I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Um, she told us that I sent the letter to the right person, which apparently was um, Premier Campbell Newman at the time. Um, and then Queensland Education, well, Leslie was the Queensland Education representative that stepped in to have a talk to his first school, find out where all the issues were um, and what was being not done to support our child. Um, I know she had a meeting with the school that we went really to go to. Um, yeah, but things did change once Leslie had been to see the school. All right, and what sort of things changed once Leslie was involved? So they introduced uh, an individual education plan for Jack. Um, they gave him an iPad to learn on because at the time he was, his books, like Jack said earlier, his books were empty. Um, and they also gave him a teacher's aid for a few hours a week. Uh, and, and did these things help Jack? Um, basically, no. I think it was too little too late. The damage was um, done by that point. Um, so really nothing that they were doing was working. And I know that we spent, Jack spent a lot of time on a beanbag in the corner of the classroom playing games on his iPad. And I questioned that once and said, why is Jack playing frog game? I don't know what it was called, some frog game on his iPad. Um, and they said, oh, we haven't downloaded any educational apps on it. And I said, well, wasn't that the whole point of the iPad to help him learn? Um, yeah, but there's, yeah, only games on it. And nearly every time we went to school to pick him up, he was in the corner on the beanbag with his iPad or asleep under the teacher's desk. So, and, and what was it like getting Jack to school around this time? Horrendous. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it didn't improve. He still didn't want to be at school. He was so afraid of that one particular teacher that, that manhandled him a couple of times. Um, and he was just, he was done, really, wasn't he? He was just, he was at the end of his tether, really. And it seemed to be that that one particular teacher, um, I actually confronted the vice principal one stage and I actually, it was only him and I there and I did, bring her name up and um, then he sat, the way he is going to fix the problem, he sat Jack next to her all day. And Jack said it was the worst day of his life, absolutely just shaken, he just didn't trust her and that was their, their fix. And he said it was just horrible, absolutely horrible. Now I have a clip from Jack that's about five minutes long that I'd like to play at this point and I think it relates to around this time that we've been talking about. It's at IND.0004.0002.0014 and once again, I understand that this will be played only for those in the Commission virtual hearing room and not more broadly.
And so, um, Sharon, Alex, around that time, I think Jack just mentioned he, he ended his school year a bit early. Yeah. Um, did you feel like he'd come to the end of the road with the school by that stage? That's the, f the first school, absolutely. Um, <coughs> pardon me. I know I went into the principal at the time and told her that we were pulling Jack out of that school. Um, and she actually said to me that she wasn't surprised in the slightest. Um, so, yeah. But then on the other hand too, we did try um, private tutoring and no one wanted to take him on because he had Tourette's. So we were prepared to put money into that, to get him still educated one-on-one -on -one, and no one wants to take him either. So it's not like we're not trying to get him educated. Then uh, Leslie Theodore gave you a suggestion about a new primary school that you followed and how did that go? What was, what was that school like for Jack, the second school? It was a wonderful school. Um, wonderful teacher that he had and the principal was just marvellous, um, very tolerant. They, right from the beginning, they accepted all of our advice and information about Tourette's and they were just so willing to help Jack. Um, it, was, it still wasn't a perfect year. We still had to fight to get him to school. Um, he still self-harmed a lot. He broke his hand that year. He broke his foot that year. Um, the principal rang me one day at work and said, oh, I'm sorry, but it, I've had Jack down at the back of the school for two hours in a meltdown and you're going to have to come and get him because he won't move. And I remember being so cranky with Jack and just so amazed at the tolerance of this poor man <laughs> dealing with him for two hours. Um, and they, they just tried really hard. They accepted the fact that Jack yelled out strange words in the class, you know, um, I know one of his ticks that year that he used to play the cup, um, the cup song and it's like a beat with your hands and your, your beat on the table or, or whatever. He did that over and over and over and over and drove the teacher nuts, but the teacher just let it go because she knew it was part of his Tourette's and he couldn't help it. Um, and on particular days, you know, the, the principal would send text messages to me telling me if Jack's had a good day or if there'd been any issues and... Yeah, it, but between that teacher and the principal, they could teach other teachers an awful lot. And I'll just add, yeah. add to the teacher in his classroom because the, the school itself was only 125 kids and there's only like nine teachers for the entire whole school plus the principal. And his particular teacher had a red ace and a black ace on his car, on his desk. And so if he was feeling anxious or something, he would turn the red one over and she wouldn't have to say anything. He might need to just go out where the bags are hanging out and just have a breather. And he'd just have to turn the card and nothing was ever, ever said. And she'd let him go out the door. But it just made a big difference to him. We've actually heard some evidence this week about the importance of teachers viewing their students positively and seeing the best in them. Is that your experience, the difference between those two schools? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. they, they didn't just look at Jack as um, a disability. Know. They looked at behind a disability and saw our Jack that we see. Accepted if him you, for all if, of if, you, if you need a break at any time, Sharon or Alex, please tell us. And uh, there is no difficulty about having a break if you need to. Thank you. I'm okay. Thank you. Um, the hardest part of that school there was when he finished, he graduated. I think he cried out. Um, you mean yeah. that he, he had to leave that school when he finished? That, that was what was the hardest thing about it? That, that was one of the best days of our lives, to be honest, for Jack. Um, it was the graduation night. His brother and um, daughter, uh, sister-in-law came as well. <laughs> That's part of me. <coughs> and they had to sing a song and I thought, oh, and Jack was, there's no way Jack's going up and singing this song with, with the class. And he, you know, so we're sort of sitting in the audience watching all of his class walk in and then right at the back comes Jack and I just lost it, cried and cried. It was so it was such a proud moment. And he actually got up there and he sang the song with his class. And, um, and it was funny because we were sitting there and when they were walking up to get their graduation certificate, I heard someone behind us go, oh, look, there's that kid with Tourette's. 
and I just like I nearly turned around and punched them. I thought, that's my son. <laughs> He's not just all about Tourette's. I mean, after after the choir, he did go outside and have a meltdown, but you know he he did it, and that was just amazing to see after the years that he'd been through that he got the courage to go and and do that. So Alex and I were up here. And just his schoolmates, like they all accepted him for what he was. Like he had threats, and that that was the biggest thing that I you know, wish I had have found that school years ago. And Thanks. that was going to be my next question. Did it did it turn it all around for Jack? Not completely. Um, I think Jack kind of was living in the moment of, of you know the graduation and the success on leaving grade seven. He didn't academically. That was the best year. So he passed, I think, two subjects that year, which was amazing on A for maths. Um, I don't know how he did that because Alex and I can't do that. Um, but, you know, the high school, the high school was a whole different ball game. So All right, well, let's talk about that. He, he was, he was moving on to high school now and you had a chat to Leslie Theodore about the different schools. Um, Leslie, really just amazing because she didn't, she did this kind of out of her scope because she dealt with the primary schools. With, um, she was just so involved with helping us with Jack and supporting us with Jack. Um, so she suggested schools. Um, I did ring a lot of the private schools thinking that may be a better option. They all told me that I don't take children like my son. Um, I also ran a special school and said maybe that's where he needs to be because his grades are so poor, but his IQ was too high. Um, and then in the end, it was suggested um, by Leslie that he's high, that the high school, high school. The most suitable one for him. Um, so that's where we went. Yeah. So and and you met with the school about uh, having Jack enrolled. That's correct. I took all the information that I had um, about Jack to the school and asked for a meeting. Um, quite daunting because there was about 12 people in the room when I went in. Um, but nevertheless, he's my son, so you do what you have to do. Um, explained to them about Jack, said this is what you need to, the triggers that you need to be aware of. Um, you know, you're going to know if he's getting anxious because of the things, you know, the particular things that he's doing. Um, so we actually left the meeting feeling fairly positive because they seemed to really take on board what I was saying. Um, but then I kind of found out later that it was probably not the case. So the second day of high school, Jack got told to shut up twice by two different teachers when he had a vocal tick. Um, and then he came home and said that he re was refusing to go back to school because it brought back memories of the teacher that was awful to him in primary school and he couldn't cope with that. So I insisted on a second meeting with the school. They pushed back and said that I'd had one. I pushed back harder and said, no, you need, you went, obviously didn't listen the first time, so I need another meeting. Um, and then, yeah, basically Jack was in almost complete school refusal by then. Um, and this particular morning, I can't even remember, he'd only been at school for a little bit. Um, he had a big meltdown that resulted in a panic attack. So, and my, our middle son, Ben, had to put Jack down and hold him down on the floor and the ambulance was called and then police came, um, which was awful because the police never come to our house. Um, and they took Jack up to the hospital and I spent, I spent a good hour listening to the mental health registrar up there telling me I have to make my son go to school. And I'm like, wow, that's how I ended up here. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it really wasn't a very nice experience after that. Um, and I know that I contacted his clinical psychologist and said, what do we do? And that's when they recommended that Jack be put into um, an adolescent mental health unit. All right, well, let's see if, I'm sorry. Alex, did you want to add anything about that time? Being on the road as a dad, and hearing your middle child doing what you should be doing is bloody pretty hard. I mean, the family's falling apart. That's what it sort of feels like, you know? Um, yeah, and that's just definitely not where, where we wanted to go in our life sort of thing. And 
and it might be hard for us, but what's hard for Jack, you know, and that's all we ever had to think about. What's he going through in his head? Um, the school itself, even I went up there a few times and had meetings with them. Um, yeah, but it's just like deaf ears. Well, we've got another clip from Jack from around this time. Operator, it's at ind.0004.0002.001 and this is broadcast publicly. It was the next Monday and this is it after the teacher roused at me and the kid yeah, yeah, doing yeah. the thing. Uh, the next Monday, I had probably one of the biggest meltdowns I'd ever had. Um, previously beaten record, um, but probably one of the biggest meltdowns, which was um, I, I just I refused to go back to high school. This is in the morning when you're this just is getting ready. To uh, I was yeah? meant to be getting ready. Yes. Okay. Um, and what happened? Mum insisted and kept insisting. She's like, "You have to. You have to. You have to. You have to." Um, you know, it's, it's then you know, it's it was illegal to not go. Kind yeah, of thing. No, um, ben was still with us at the time, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I was that distraught that I think before it all kicked off, I was even vomiting. That's how panicked I was. Yeah. Um, and it always goes from certain people go can go from sad to angry to nervous to angry. Um, and that's how it was. I just blew up. Um, and what happened? It got to the point where I was that violent that my brother, my middle brother, had to pin me down onto the ground and lay on top of me because I was going to... I had already cut my arms and he had to lay on... Uh, cut up my arms and he had to lay on top of me to stop me and from hurting probably even mum at the time. Um, and mum called an ambulance. But since I was... 13, yeah, I was 13, turning 14. Uh, they considered me a young adult almost. Um, that, well, not a young adult, but they I was a danger. Yeah. Um, I could have been, been a danger to the paramedics. So they it was accompanied by police and the police came in first and they had to make sure that I wasn't violent, but I had already pretty much passed out onto the bed. Um, the paramedics came in, checked my pulse, checked my heartbeat, uh, put me in the and then they took me up to the hospital. Uh, I can't, I, even then I can't really remember, my whole brain was just blurred. Um, okay, so, so now we're not going to go back to school. And now we're not going back to school. And as Jack says, he, he didn't go back to school after that, did he? No, he did not. I think you took him to, or he went to the um, adult uh, sorry, the Adolescent Inpatient Unit and Day Service, is that right? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so he was sent there to for some therapy and to try and reintegrate him back into school. Um, he went as a day patient, um, so four days a week. Um, and their focus in there was uh, exposure therapy so you know most of these kids had such terrible anxiety that they wouldn't leave they didn't want to leave the house so they forced these kids to do things that they hated doing so going shopping and, and going into crowded shopping centers and um and also they had a numeracy and literacy program in there but it was very basic and sort of just to keep keep the kids up to speed and there was obviously lots and lots of therapy and and things like that and Alex, after that, you managed to get Jack enrolled in Flexi. Tell us about that. Well, um, the Flexi Learning Centre is pretty much uh, when where all troubled youth go. They get kicked out of every school. Um, and so this is just an opportunity I heard. And I went down there and they actually teach them life skills. They do a bit of education. But it's mainly life skills and stuff that they learn, things with their hands, try and give them a bit of hope. Um, it took a few weeks to try and get him in there. I just kept nagging him and nagging him, and eventually they said yes. So we went there and I took Jack down to the interview. He met the teachers and everything, and it seemed to be okay. Um, and then he got off of drugs and stuff in there and he saw horrible violence. And yeah, he just pulled himself out of there. They used to make him go down the road and they'd pick him up from down the road, uh, about two blocks away. Um, he went there for a, a few, what, three months maybe? 
he went there for a little bit, but then once he got off of the drugs and saw the violence, yeah, he just said, it's not for me. He couldn't understand why he had to go to a school with criminals. Yeah. When he wasn't one himself, so. And Alex, you, um, well, well, sorry, w was Jack still enrolled at the high school that he'd attended briefly? Yes, yeah. He was enrolled all the way through Hawks. And the idea of, of that was to um, go back to high school the following year. And I think he actually, I think we went in there and I, the following year before he went to Flexi, I, I did go in there and, you know, had a meeting and so forth. And I was pretty much, and I was told by the um, vice principal that we need to sign him out. And I said, why is that? And they said, because he looks bad on our records that he's absent all the time. Um, and I said, but he's still a student, he needs to be enrolled somewhere. And that's what they said to me. Yeah, but not on our books, it looks bad. We've got an absenteeism person all the time. So then yes. like that day, I just was pretty cranky, said a few beautiful words and signed him out, basically. And when you say signed him out, do you mean you unenrolled him? Unenrolled him, I was told to. Yeah. yeah. I was told literally unenrolling. So. All right, and um, after, Jack stopped going to Flexi. Is it fair to say that was it for him in formal education? Um, we did re did have a look at, um, you know, teaching him remotely. Um, but I figured the kid he they told me it would be about eighteen hundred dollars, and I'd have to leave work, so it wasn't financially viable for us to do that. And I figured. If the teachers couldn't teach Jack or get Jack to do schoolwork, there was no way that I was going to be able to. Um, and he's, yeah, and any sort of mention to Jack about learning, he just shuts down. Even now, yeah. even at the age of nine. And so how old was Jack when he finished formal education? 14, I think he may have been, 13, 14. 13, I think, yeah. 13, yeah. 14, yeah. And, and was there any more follow-up from the Department of Education about him after that? No. Um, we heard from nobody, actually. I kind of, I was a bit afraid that somebody would knock on the door um, or have even the Department of Child Safety come and knock on the door and say, you know, you're, you're failing his parents, his son needs to be in school and take him office. So that was always in the back of my mind, but we never heard from anybody. So we just worked on keeping him alive um, and keeping him trying to build him back up again that's and we're still working on that now all right i'm going to play a clip from jack talking about where he was a few months ago when this clip was recorded and then i'm going to ask you about how he's doing now okay the clip i'm going to play is at ind.0004.0002.0024 thank you operator yeah what are you going to what are you doing now with yourself uh, like what? Like what am I doing? What do I want? Yeah. Do? What are you doing now? Like what are you doing with your life now? What are you What are you doing? Well, my life consists of a lot of sleep, probably an extra five hours more than necessary, maybe even six, sometimes even eight to nine. Um, sleeping, sharing, toilet going in my room, reading and watching shows. Okay. And seeing, I do have my carers, which I will sometimes go out to eat with at sushi. But even then, um, I kind of follow behind him like a penguin or a, or a child. We had a moment in our last trip. Uh, at sushi? Yeah. Yeah, where I couldn't see uh, my sister-in-law was at sushi uh with us not with us but she was in the same you know shop and uh i was i literally had to hide because i was panicking and fretting over the thought of you know confrontation of any kind oh, of like engaging talking. in conversation engaging yeah yeah um hmm. okay How's Jack doing now? Jack is probably the most unwell that he's ever been. 
Um, he does have the NDIS, which we're so thankful, and has carers that come. Um, Jack has got di um, been diagnosed with agoraphobia now, so he very, very rarely leaves the house. Um, and like he said, he sleeps a lot. Um, he's got clinical obsessive compulsive disorder, which is pretty much ruling his entire life right now. Um, he said to me the other day that, you know, because I say, you must be so lonely, Jack. And he says, I'm so used to being alone that I'm not lonely. Um, but I, th I think that he is. Jack has no concept of how to do any life skills. He's got no concept of how to manage money, how to pay bills. Um, at the moment, he's got no concept of how to step outside, actually. But he's <laughs> he's just, he's, he's not in a good place. So we do everything that we can to try and keep him here. He's still having therapy. Um, but the bottom line is we've been told he needs to be in a hospital to try and get some sort of treatment in there before anything will change. Um, Can I just add to that? The biggest thing that with Jack as well is when we just go, if he does come out and we go to the shops, he left school a long time ago, many years ago. He sees a kid in a school uniform his head goes down, his shoulders are shrunk, and he pretty much wants to hide. And then he gets that anxious that he feels sick and he needs to go home. Mm -hmm. And he's, he just comes up to us now and just says, I've got to go, I've got to go. There's, there's, no, there's no shows, there's no going out, there's no, you know, it's very rare to get him out of the house. So that affects our life as well, like, you know, um, because we don't leave him there because- Especially at night. Yeah parties, families, we've lost friends, families, um, because of that reason, because we don't go to family functions. Um, and he's that anxious, it's not funny. In a moment, I'm going to finish by hearing from Jack about what he hopes from this Royal Commission. But before I do that, before I play that clip, I'd like to ask you what you'd like to tell the commissioners about what you hope from this Royal Commission. I think you need, um, the Commission needs to understand that the education system doesn't work for all of these children. These children aren't defined by their disability, that's just part of them. Um, you need to see, you know, most kids, a lot of kids won't, be, won't do well in mathematics and you know what, that's okay because they might shine in another area. You've got to stop focusing so much on all these um, tests and things that you do with these kids because when they leave high school or when they leave school, none of that matters. What matters is that they're, they've been you know, taught to have confidence in themselves and to be proud of who they are and, and you know, not be afraid to have an opinion and not be afraid to go, oh, yeah, I got a D for maths, but I don't mind because I'm amazing at English and I'm not going to use math too much math when I step outside of this school. You know, you, you just need to recognise that what what you do to these kids and, and, you know, once a word has been thrown, that word can affect their entire life because you look at my son now and he's trapped in our house because of things that happened to him when he was a young boy and it doesn't matter how much we used to try to build him up when he came home and tell, and tell him how wonderful he is and how funny he is and you know, and how empathetic and such a beautiful soul that he is. He would go to school the next day and get beaten down, you know? So, so whatever we tried to do that night, it was, it was gone by the next day. And, and we're still trying to find that now to make him feel like he's a worthwhile person. You know, he's only got grade four English and math skills. He can barely write his own name. Um, but you talk to Jack and he's just so eloquent in his speech and he's such a gentleman and, you know, you, you get onto a subject that he's interested in, like animals or the universe, or and he will talk for hours to you about it, whether you want to listen or not, because he'll make you listen. Um, and we have to let him because he, he doesn't talk to anybody else. Um, and his perception of, of friendship is the people that he talks to over his earphones when he's playing Xbox. And that's really, really sad. Um, so, you know, there's so much beautiful to, to our son that, that and everyone's missing out on that. He's not just Tourette's and he's not, he's not just, 
you know, noises and, and, and whew, yeah, and, 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 you know, funny movements and things. And some of it's hilarious. Don't get me wrong. It's funny. But at, at the same time, it's, it's just debilitating, you know, and he's just, he's just lost out on so much. He doesn't know how to socialise. Um, so if the commission can do anything is stop focusing on what the kids are good at, uh, sorry, what the kids aren't good at and focus on what they are good at. You know, I just, that, that's all I really wanted to say. Yeah. Alex, would you like to say Well, that? I sort of believe that these kids, I mean, these teachers that are in university now need to know how, what an effect they have on kids. It doesn't matter how old these kids are, they've got to be taught that, you know, if you do something or say something to these children, you know, that it can either turn them good or bad, you know, make their life hell. I mean, at the end of the day, I sort of look at it and I think, who's going to employ Jack? What life does he have, you know, now because he can't read, right? He's got grade four education. I mean, not many people are going to employ him. I think as a dad, that's hard. Well, and what happens to Jack when we're not here? Two, really? Yeah. I'm going to um, finish the questions that I have for you by playing uh, the final clip of Jack at ind.0004.0002.0024. Um, and then I'll ask the commissioners if they have any questions for you. Thank you. Uh, if it's all right, 
<clears throat> with you. I'll ask the commissioners if they have any questions. Is that okay with you? Fine, thank you. All right, I'll ask first Commissioner Atkinson, who is in Brisbane. Um, no, I don't have any questions, but I do want to say thank you very much uh, for the evidence you've given today. It's very important and it's very important for, to us to hear what you have to say. Thank you. And, <coughs> and Jack, of course, as well. Commissioner Mason. No, thank you. Commissioner Gelber. Um, I have no questions, but I also want to thank you very much um, for the evidence today. Thank you. Um, Sharon and Alex, uh, as you've just heard, the uh, commissioners want to thank you most sincerely <clears throat> for sharing your story and for sharing Jack's story with us today. It is very important and I want to convey our appreciation and admiration to you for what you've done over the years and for appearing today and giving evidence to us. And I'd like you, please, to convey to Jack our appreciation for his contribution. It is something that we will remember and it is really very important to us and he should know that. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, letting us have our say, basically. Hopefully we can help a lot of other kids too. We hope so. <clears throat> Ms Bennett, should we now take an adjournment? Yes, yeah, sorry. Chair, yeah, yes, an adjournment would be great. Thank you. Uh, okay, 20 minutes, if that's convenient. 20 minutes, we'll do that. Thank you. Please, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, uh, Dr. Melafont. Thank you. The next witness is Leslie Theodore. You will find her statement at Tender Bundle Part C, Volume 1, Tab 4. I tender that statement and ask it be marked Exhibit 7.164, and the annexures there too is 7.164.1 through to 7.164.4. Yes, thank you. Ms. Theodore is in the witness box here with us in Brisbane. Ms. Theodore, I'm just waiting for you to come on screen so I can see you. Is that going to happen? Yes, thank you. You've, you've miraculously appeared. Thank you very much. Thank you for appearing at the Royal Commission to uh, give evidence. Uh, if you would be good enough to follow the instructions of Commissioner uh, Atkinson's associate, and she will administer the uh, oath or affirmation, as the case may be. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Theodore. If you wouldn't mind paying attention to Dr. Melifont, and she will ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Could you morning. state your full name, please? My name is Leslie Jean Theodore. Now, do you hold a diploma of teaching in primary and special? schooling, majoring in human, hearing impairment, and you got that in 1979? That's correct, yes, I do. And you have a graduate diploma of occupational health and safety, 2007? That's correct. And you started teaching in 1980? I did. Gather you've seen a few changes over the last I have. few decades. Um, what's your current role? I'm a principal education officer, student services. Within the Department of Education, Queensland? Yes. Okay. Your statement refers to you being a statewide validator in 2007. What's that? Um, that's a, a position within the Education Adjustment Program, um, which uh, provides, uh, I guess, some oversight over um, the regions, the schools, their... their um, education adjustment profiles that they complete for students, that they are correct um, and uh, 
that the documentation that schools provide actually match up with um, the adjustments that schools say they are providing in the um, education adjustment profile. Um, it's a bit of an auditing tool. Uh, okay, so I'll come back to that. Can I ask you, does that position, although you don't hold it, does that position still exist? Yes, it does. And is there just one of them? Um, I believe there, the last I knew there were two or three. Statewide? Statewide, yeah. Oh, okay. And you did that for a, um, a period of time within 2007 before then moving to the role of principal education That's officer. correct. It was six months I did that. Thank you. So um, since 2007, apart from a period in 2018, in the central office in the disability and inclusion team as a senior advisor, you've held the role of principal education officer. That's correct. PEO. Yes. And that was first in Townsville. Yes. And more recently in metropolitan Brisbane. Yes. Since when for Brisbane? Um, so the beginning of 2019. Now, in your statement, you describe PEOs as having a variety of responsibility which differs on the needs of the region they are assigned to. I wanted to ask you, though, what's their key function as you understand it? It, it is such a broad role. It's hard to, to pin down a key function, but it's around supporting the region, so regional officers, and schools to um, to provide um, an inclusive education for students in schools. So it's it's work with regional officers, it's work with principals, it's work with school staff. And precisely what that might look like on a day-to-day -day basis will vary region to region and PEO to PEO, is that Correct. right? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, and you described in paragraph nine of your statement that the work is really about legislation and policy. Is it's that correct? It's a very big part of the work, yes. All right. And is that work about trying to help the educators in the regions, teachers and principals, to navigate their way through the education policies and procedures and legislation? That's a very good way of putting it, yes. Okay. But there's no precise um, description about how you as a PEO must do that? No. Okay, so no. you agree with me? Yes. Okay, so it really comes down to the individual PEO as to how they're going to try and um, demystify or explain the overall policies and procedures of the department, correct? Yes, that's correct. And to advise and provide guidance to the educators within the region about legislation. Yes, that's correct. Including the DDA and the DSE. Yes. Okay. That's a lot. Yes. Yeah. And there's not, there's a quite a bit of a demand, quite a bit of demand on your time. Um, sorry, put it in a different way. <laughs> uh, from your perspective, would you like to have more PEOs to be able to, to, to carry the burden of that work? Uh, from my perspective? Yes. Um, your perspective. I would like there to be more PEOs. Um, when we are trying to support over 250 schools in my current region and we have three PEOs, so we're spread very thinly across um, all of our schools, uh, I guess reducing our ability to respond um, to some of them um, as we would like to. Okay. And so far as you're aware, to hold the position of PEO, there's no formal qualification required. Is that your understanding? That, that's my understanding, yeah. Okay. And your statement says that in 2007, in 
at that stage as PEO. You had carriage of supporting students with disability, students in out-of-home care, migrant and refugee students, and students with mental health concerns. And you describe it as like anyone who had challenges came through PEOs who were considered, and I'm summarising, jack of all trades without any specialist knowledge. Yeah. So what it appeared at the time was that um, any any student who presented with um, difficulties, uh, the PEOs were the ones that schools would contact effectively to ask, you know, what do we do, who do we, how do we deal with this? Um, now, with the PEOs, with our varied backgrounds, we didn't necessarily have experience in that particular area that they would be um, asking about. So, um, you know, particularly in the mental health area, I have no particular background in that and I would be going to other people and asking advice and then I'd be coming back to respond to the school. So it was probably not a really focused support at that time. Okay, and I want to understand from your experience, uh, do some of those challenges or problems still exist to current time? Yes. Okay, in what way? So there are still students who have mental health concerns. Uh, sorry, can I just confirm to you, do you mean for myself? Yes, or, well, you're, okay. you're speaking... For yourself, um, let's start with in that. this role. So in for this, this role. role, okay. For this role, I'm sorry. No, there are not the same challenges in that respect because the department has now provided um, additional advisors, experts, coaches um, in some of those areas uh, that I now am not required to to try to go sourcing. I know that if someone phones me, um, a school phones me about uh, a concern for a student with um, mental health conditions or concerns, there is a mental health, uh, a principal advisor for the mental health area. So I can refer to them. So um, I don't have to be as much of that jack of all trades. Okay. There's still a lot of diversity required of you, though, in your yes. current role, yes? Yes. And what do you find the continuing challenges are or the existing challenges are for you in this role? Uh, probably be that um, despite a lot of the um, what is provided by the department around guidelines and policies and procedures are not being followed in schools and there is that constant challenge of how to uh, work with a school um, without brandishing a big stick at them, but developing that relationship with them to then be able to advise them that there are new guidelines and how are you going with those. And it, it's um, you just have to find creative ways of, um, you know, supporting schools in that way. But that's a big challenge is that, that the changed environment that many people are just don't seem to be still aware of. Okay, Ms. what Theodore, are the other changes? I'm, so, I'm sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but at the moment I don't have a quite a clear understanding of what your current role and responsibilities <laughs> are. Would you mind just explaining? I understand that it's not uh, the jill of all trades that you had to you, you had to perform previously, but. Obviously, there must be responsibilities. What are what are they, if you don't mind encapsulating them yep. for us? Certainly. Um, so wide-ranging, we support, uh, we have some supervision kind of um, requirements around supporting uh, advisory visiting teachers, uh, the heads of special education in schools. And for those, we try to... Um, we answer a lot of their questions. So they may not be quite sure of procedure or um, where to find something, some information or a policy or what should they do in, in certain cases. 
So a lot of our role is around providing advice to those um, people who contact us, um, building their capability to be able to do that for themselves, show them how to research stuff like that for themselves. Um, we have some operational responsibilities. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of early childhood development programs. Um, we provide a lot of support and supervision to those. We are the we make recommendations to whether children are eligible for early childhood programs, and there are quite a, a lot of applications that come in. Um, we pro, uh, are the approvers for uh, transport assistance under the school transport assistance program for students with disabilities. Um, in this region, that amounts to several thousand applications and reviews every year. Uh, there are department um, actions or procedures every year that we provide the oversight of in our region. Um, the nationally consistent collection of data on school students with disabilities. Uh, most of the PEOs are the overseers of that in our regions and we provide professional development to the schools. We um, support them through the whole uh, process in collecting their data and getting that into central office. Um, we monitor the um, Adjustment Informa Information Management System, which is our um, disability database effectively. Uh, we monitor that, we keep an eye to try and assist schools to identify when there might be some extra work they need to do or that um, there's something they need to follow up at their school at various times. We are the are your, conduit. Are your responsibilities limited to students with disability? Uh, for the most part, but within students with disabilities, we also have um, students in out-of-home out care who have disabilities. We have students um, who are migrant or refugees who have disabilities. So we do still touch across many areas. And there are three of you for 250 schools to do all these things? Um, that's in the metropolitan region, yes. Hmm. So that, every sounds, region has an allocation like of have, principal. Don't, sounds like you don't have a lot of trouble filling in your work day. No, we don't. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, okay. Dr. Melapont, please continue. Thank you. All right. I'm going to come down back to some of those themes. So people seeking your advice, that might be principals, correct? Yes, yes. Um, teachers? Yes. And... Uh, Heads of special education service. Yes. Sometimes called hoses That's for right. short. <laughs> uh, but some people who hold that position, it's entitled heads of inclusive education or similar. That's correct. Okay. So in terms of the language, some schools are still within that the special education language and some schools are still within the inclusive education That's language. That's correct. And that comes down to the individual school choice about what to call the job. Is that That's right? correct. Okay. Um, sometimes families contact you directly. Yes. How do they get your number? I know in North Queensland it used to be passed around. Um, once a family did, once you did make contact with a family, we didn't have call blocking. So, you know, they could see the number and then they had you. So they would just ring directly. And did this occur in your experience for families who felt that they weren't getting traction within the school? That's correct, yes. Okay. Can I take you to, and I'll ask uh, for this to come up on screen. On the screen, it's your statement, which is stat.0080.0011. One at page uh, four, and it's paragraph thirteen. Yes. 
So if we can just um, bring up paragraph 13. I'm not sure if that's – oh, you've got your statement in front yes, of you. Yes, I do. So you Sorry. can read it. Okay. I have it, yes. So can I just get you to orient yourself um, to paragraph 13? And you start there by mentioning that PEOs received requests. But I want to go over to the next page. And the part I want to ask you about is the second line, which is we strive to build the capability of hoses and advisory teachers and give them the right tools and information to assist families rather than becoming directly involved with families ourselves. First, what's an advisory visiting teacher? So advisory visiting teachers are teachers who have been seconded into regional positions, so they don't actually um, belong specifically to a school. They sit within the region and they, they move about to different schools um, on demand, like at our request or on demand. Okay. So help me understand the difference between an advisory visiting teacher and an inclusion coach. Uh, an advisory visiting teacher will uh, can spend more direct time at a school probably. Um, they may become involved for a specific child for a specific purpose. Uh, the inclusion coaches, my understanding is they are more uh, general and look at the entire school um, journey around inclusion. Okay. And you say your understanding, where does that understanding come from? Uh, previous um, introduction to the role years ago. Um, I haven't read up on their role description recently. No. So, <laughs> no, But also that's... working with an inclusion um, principal advisor inclusion, the name change, um, currently. So we work together when we identify um, a, a situation that may require, does it require the inclusion coach or does it require something more direct specifically for a student that may be an advisory teacher? Okay. So... Um, so your understanding of the respective roles is what you pick up from your day-to-day -day work as opposed to, say, a formalised teaching or training or dissemination of information from the department. Is that correct? Several years ago, I would have read those role descriptions, okay. but then each region, again, slightly adjusts what they require them to do. Okay. Okay. I take it it's not possible to keep up with what each region is doing and the way in which they're doing it. You just have to kind of go with what you can. And and I, what I tend to do with, from my experience, is um, what I have in front of me is what I deal with. I don't try to know ev everybody else's job. Mm -hmm. I know roughly what they do and will speak with them if there is something that I believe they could help the situation I'm dealing with and together we would work out you know, a way forward. Can I take you back into this statement and the part which talks about giving them the right tools and information? What don't they have that they're coming to you looking for? Um, probably it's a, it's a solid knowledge of uh, the policies, procedures, guidelines, ways of doing things, um, and sometimes I don't have that either, but together we work through it. So I will often say to them, are you in front of your computer? And they say, yes. I say, okay, let's do this together. And I step them through um, how to access a, a procedure or something. Uh, a good example would be... Um, uh, a head of special ed phoned me recently and said, I just want to make sure that we're doing this part-time attendance right. And I asked, "Did you um, have you accessed the guidelines? Are you using the plan? Oh. Um, so I said, okay. So from that, I guess you don't know. So while you're there, 
and I would step stepped her through the um, the pathway to actually get to that. Yes. And she said, oh, my goodness, this is great. Um, I'm going to go away and read this now and I'm going to take it back to my leadership team. Okay. And the, oh, I'm sorry. And there you're speaking about the part-time attendance guideline which was um, promulgated 2020 by the Department of Education. Is yes, that correct? Yes, that's correct. And do I take it from that communication that she was not aware um, of the specific guideline until you told her about it? Um, she may not have been. Yes. Um, we do put out, in our region, we do put out communication when there is something new. So we would, at the start of every term, we send out, um, and e the PEOs send out an email and just advise the, our contacts in every school um, of anything that might be new or that's, you know, they need to, to be aware of. So... I do recall that we did put that into our very first email. Okay. Um, I can't guarantee you that everybody reads every bit of that or clicks on every link. No, no. And um, I'm not asking you to step into the mind of that person who, who rang you, but, but I take it from the fact that she was asking you about it and you told her that it's, on, yeah. it's online and had to teach her about that. That, that, that was information she just didn't have. That's correct. Didn't appear to have before then. That's correct. Okay. And, and you've just said that um, there is an email out to your contacts. What's that mean? So we have set up in this region, and I know most regions do this, um, a contact person in every school. Um, mostly it's the head of special education, but if there is no head of special education, it may be a teacher, it may be the principal. It may be a deputy principal, but we have every school, a contact in every school, so that we uh, make sure that necessary information from the department, so that, like this email that tells them what's coming up this term, um, can get into that school. Okay. And is that a single point of contact per school? Yes. And is there a mechanism which um, follows up to make sure they've got it and they've passed it on to their school? No. Okay. That's really up to them. I <laughs> oh. leave that to them. Yes, I, I understand. Um, I'm not suggesting you need to be contacting yeah, no. 250 people <laughs> to make sure they've done it personally. Uh, can I ask you, please, again, if we can have paragraph 13 up? You give an example of when a hose might uh, contact you as being a tr an inquiry uh, about providing a transfer note, and in this occasion it was requested by a non-state school, and you explained it was in the enrolment procedure. I actually want to understand what a transfer note is. Okay. So when a student moves schools, in order to facilitate transfer of information about particularly a student with a disability, but any student, um, a school can request a transfer note from the previous school. Okay. So that is a document that provides that um, provides information that schools that may be helpful to the receiving school uh, to assist them to get support in place as quickly as possible. To your understanding, is that compulsory at both ends? That is compulsory from the receiving school to get a transfer note and compulsory from the previous school to provide one? Um, it's not compulsory for them to request it, but if you are asked to provide it, then it's in our procedure and I would expect schools to do that. Okay. And what's AIMS information? The Adjustment Information Management System. Um, so what? that's our database. And you can run a variety of reports off that um, that you're able to provide to, to the um, receiving school. Is that different to or part of one school? It is part of one school. And is that where you would expect for adjustments to be recorded? Correct, yes. Uh, and in your experience, that's not always perfectly or completely recorded? I'll, I'll qualify that. 
that is one place. So that is where the information around adjustments um, for the purposes of our education adjustment program are stored in AIMS. There is also within just within the one school platform, there is a place where schools can record plans, adjustments, they can um, upload and store those things in, in, in a support tab. Okay. And each of those depend for their completeness on um, the information being input by humans in schools on a regular and complete basis. Is correct. that correct? Yes. And you would have experienced occasions in which it appeared to you that that information was, in fact, incomplete. That's correct. Okay. Not infrequently? Um, it's a bit subjective. It happen, It certainly happens more than you'd like it to see. More, yeah. More than, right? yeah. More than I'd like there to be. Okay. Just want to understand something about... Um, complex needs and your statement reflects that uh, each region has its own processes but sometimes that PEOs are included in considering applications from schools for additional staffing, usually teachers' aides for students with complex needs. Mm -hmm. That's correct That's so far? Correct, yeah. And is that known as a complex needs application? No, it, it would vary in all the regions what it's called. In metropolitan region at the moment, it's called a request for support. A request for support. Okay, so we heard from Sarah um, about a complex needs submission and she explained that her understanding was it was an application that a school could make for extra funding and resourcing. That would be correct. Yeah. Okay, so your understanding matches her understanding. Correct, yes. Okay. We try to be consistent with the, the, the terminology that we use at region. Yeah. We can't always guarantee that that terminology is used exactly in schools. So schools may use different terminology but for the same process. Right. And that terminology might find itself in one school by way of an entry, yes? It may. And people reading that later have to discern what that terminology means? Yes. Okay. Um, can you remind me, did you, what did you call it, a request for? Request for support. Okay. So I must say that I've read a fair bit of information about the funding within Queensland and it kind of did my head in. So... Can you explain to me the difference between a request for support and a complex needs application? Um, in metropolitan region, it would be the same thing. Okay. But for the rest of the Queensland, it could be different. It could be different. Okay. And within complex needs applications for metropolitan Brisbane, what's your understanding as to who can apply for that kind of funding? So um, schools will apply on the basis of the complexity they're experiencing within their environment. Um, if they are having difficulty with a student for a range of reasons, um, and I guess I, even what I just said then, I, I don't like saying it in that way, I, I but that's the basis that they will, they they feel they are having difficulty for some reason and they will put in a request for support. It may be um, uh, disengagement. It may be that the child is um, acting out in, in a variety of ways. Uh, and they don't necessarily know how to deal with it, and often the default position is to ask for a teacher aid. So we'll put in an applicate a request for support. Yes. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to come to parts of your your statement which speak about student behaviour, so that um, people watching this will understand that. The language here differs from your language in the statement and that you, you demonstrate your understanding of 
it being about the child. Is, um, sorry, that it's not really acting out as such. No. So, so we'll be. I, I just wanted to put that on record that we will come to that part where you you explain your very clear understanding. Okay. So, but what I do want to ask you about um, here is with this complex needs funding, um, is it incumbent on the parent or caregiver? To put that in train or is it the school? No, it should be the school. Okay. And if it's granted, does the money, does the funding have to go to the child in respect of whom so if the application an allocation is made? If an allocation is made and it's not money, it's it's uh, a number of teacher aid hours or, or a full-time equivalent in teacher time sometimes, um, it the school, well, there would be an expectation that the school would use it in the way that they have explained they would use it in the application, which is usually directly involved with the student who they're applying for. Okay. So it's an expectation that it would be for that student and that usually would occur, but there's no obligation and it doesn't always occur in that way. Is that your experience? I would expect there is an obligation, but once the region has made the allocation, I guess we don't have control over what happens. Okay. And there is no audit that you're aware of that makes sure that the funding applied for was used for the purpose stated in the application? No. Okay, so you agree with me? Yes. Okay. You've said that there was, there is, in your view, there is an obligation. Where is that obligation contained in writing? It's not, writ it's not in writing. There does seem to be it's quite a lot in folklore within this program. Do you think that's right? Uh, I guess you could say that. Can I just focus on that word obligation as you used it so I can understand how you meant it? Mm. Were you saying that from your perspective they ought to be using it in that way? Yes. Okay. As compared to it is your understanding that there is a formal requirement within the Department of Education that mandates that it is used in that way. That's correct. There's no mandate, yeah. Okay. Um, now, with these applications, there's actually no requirement at all for a PEO to be involved. Is that right? No. It would be a re it's a regional process and in our region we establish a panel who looks at the applications. Um, when we do that, it's not just the written application that we are provided. We look at one school. So at the one school records, we look at the behaviours, we look at the support plans that are in place. We, um, we look at absences, we look at records of contact, just so we get a really full picture of what's happening for that student at that school. Okay. And we use all of that to make a recommendation to the actual decision maker on, you know, the, the allocations to schools. Okay. And your statement speaks about it involving reading multiple applications. What, what's multiple? So um, la, some weeks we will have 30 um, some of those may be reviews and it may be half a dozen of those are reviews. Okay. So, so I think I could probably stop you there. So you mean multiple in the context of different applications, not multiple applications for the one student? That's correct. Thank you. That's, I just need a clarification of that. Um, so when you get an application in and you're looking into one school and it occurs to you or it appears to you that the information there is incomplete, um, to your understanding, is there an obligation on you to go looking for information to fill those perceived gaps? So we, our process is that someone in the panel on the panel um, will approach the school, will find the school, and ask for more information. Okay. And what if the school doesn't 
bring itself to bring that information to you. Then we can't progress that application, that that request. And does that happen? We, it does time? occasionally, but also we, um, they may apply for an additional resource or be asking for additional teacher aid time, but through our investigations in one school, we identify that um, they may actually get some value out of having one of our um, principal advisors or our coaches um, making contact with them. So we do take that upon ourselves then to make that person to, to make contact with the school and just explore a bit further if there is more that we can do to support the school. Okay. So you might, in that process, identify things that the, the school haven't thought of or haven't pursued yet. That's correct. Okay. And you might make suggestions to the school about that. Yes. But they're not always taken. Um, no, okay. that's correct. Oh, sorry. Yes, you're right. It's not okay. always taken. And, and you yourself have experienced circumstances where, for example, you've recommended... Um, um, adjustments be made and is that correct yes okay which are which suggestions are not always taken up that's correct and in fact you've had one principal say to you um i appreciate your advice leslie but i'm going to do it anyway correct okay so now, that, that one that particular was around a suspension around this around a suspension yeah. thank you um so it, some of this will largely depend upon um, the principal, the teachers, the hose within the particular school. That's correct. Okay. And as I understand uh, your evidence and what you've informed the commission of, some are excellent, yes? Yes. Um, and some are not. Yes. And everything in between. That's correct. And even for the ones, principals, teachers, heads of educa special education, even for the ones that are very good, motivated, skilled, they might still have a bad day. Yes. Okay. Um, so to your knowledge and understanding, is there a cl clear mechanism in place for determining where um, principals or heads of education, special education, etc., are not taking up recommendations for adjustments? Um, we don't have any formal monitoring in place for that. So the place we find, when we find out that that um, there are issues is usually through complaints. Okay. So I just want to, I do want to touch on complaints um, for a moment. Excuse me. So at the school level, is the first port of call the principal for, for a complaint? Uh, it should be. Sometimes it's not. Okay. And in what circumstances isn't it? Parents may feel that they, and this is just my opinion, parents may feel they, they're they not getting um, a good hearing. So they, they may phone the region. Um, they may bypass the region and go to their local member. It, it just it varies. It varies. Okay. And have you, in your experience, had uh, parents voice concerns to you that they can feel a little um, intimidating or stressful to have to make the complaint within the school to the principal? Um, I haven't had anyone say anything like that directly to me. Okay. All right. It's not to say it isn't the case, but I, not my experience. All right. I want to um, come now to the EAP, which you've touched on already. 
And as we understand it, it's a process to verify students into six disability categories, autism, intellectual disability, speech language impairment, vision impairment, physical impairment and hearing impairment. Um, in, in your experience, that does not capture all students with disability that come within schools? That's correct. And is it your understanding that even if the EAP has been gone through and a student has received an EAP verification, there is no guarantee of funds flowing to the student in consequence? Um, no. You agree? There does not have to be, yeah. Uh, so it's left to the school level to decide how that money is to be spent? That's correct. And so, it's, again, it's, it's, it's usually not money. It's usually um, teacher and teacher aid time. Okay. Can it be money, though? Or is that the student the 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 funding resourcing model is um, around for students with disabilities around teacher and teacher aid time. Within there, there is also uh, an allocation, uh, a money allocation to schools through through a grant um, that they receive every year, mm. and that's based on um, teacher full time equivalent at that school. But then the teacher full-time equivalent is based on the students at the school. So okay. it varies across schools, but the base amount is is um, consistent. All right. Just want to ask a couple more questions before I move to the next topic. Um, are you aware of a precise mechanism in place within the department to track the impact of funding? No, I am not. Uh, to your knowledge and experience, and tell me if this is outside your knowledge and experience, uh, do principals in Queensland disaggregate key data sets for all students and analyse the performance of cohorts of students, including students with a disability in this funding context? Um, to my knowledge, uh, principals do interrogate their data. Uh, whether they interrogate their data alongside their funding, I couldn't tell you. Okay. Dr. Melifont, I'm sorry. I know you've left the topic of reasonable adjustments, but I'm afraid it may be because of my own lack of understanding. I don't follow certain things that I'd like clarified. Um, and if you don't mind, um, I'd like to uh, ascertain from Ms. Theodore if she can help me. If we take a theoretical case of a student in, let us say, a primary school, who, according to the school, is creating difficulties for the school because of behavioural issues, and the school wants to assist because it can perceive that the child requires some form of adjustment, they're not entirely sure what is needed, but they're pretty sure it's not just a teacher's aid, that there are other issues involved with the child. What actually happens in practice? What does the, what does the school do? Who, do? who does the school contact? What are the options available, whether it's you or your equivalent or others? So there are a, a number of support services um, within every region. The department provides us with a range of um, different support services from the coaches that I mentioned. Um, there is uh, an allocation for behaviour support services, and again, every region will. Well, just take just do take your own. Slightly differently. I, I, obviously, yeah. I don't expect you to know what the position is elsewhere. But what is available to you in your region, which I take it from what you've said, is the Brisbane region. Yeah. Um, so we have behaviour support services. But what we does that have mean? senior. What, what, so, sorry. What does what are the behaviour? This is what I'm trying to understand. What are the behaviour support services that are available to yeah. you? Yeah. So behaviour support services is a team of teachers with particular expertise in um, working with schools in behaviour supports for students. 
Uh, they provide professional development. They provide direct service into the schools. They, um, they're, they're probably the main things. Uh, there are senior guidance officers who also provide that advice to schools. They they, are they provide part some of the are they part of the behavioural support team or are they separate? <clears throat> They're separate to the behaviour support services. Uh, can we just come back to the sorry, sorry, can we just right. come back to the behavioural support services? How many do you have in the Brisbane region? I'd have to take that on notice. I actually don't can't give you the answer to that. Do you have lots or too few? Um well, there are quite a few, but are there enough? Possibly not. Uh, and from my understanding, uh, an, a certain level of that is school purchased. So the schools actually um, provide some funding to region to employ those behaviour specialists. And if the school wants a behavioural specialist, they come to you or your equivalent, to ask for a behavioural specialist or does it happen Well, in not to me, way? no. Sorry, no, not to me. They, um, that's a separate area and they, they have a different request for that. So who processes such a request or who determines that such a request would be appropriate to be made? Um, so the schools themselves put in that would put in a request. Uh, there is a manager for our behaviour support services that would that person would be um, the one who would deal with that. I see. So how does the school know whether they should go to you or to the behavioural support people if they're not entirely sure of how the particular issue should be handled? So often if it's about behaviour, they will go directly to behaviour support services. Uh, some people have... Um, I guess it's a, a bit about the relationship you build with the um, leaders in the school and so they may phone me directly and I can advise, you know, if it's something, if it's about only about behaviour, I could direct them to the behaviour support services but I could also investigate a bit further whether it's about, actually about disability, not necessarily the behaviour, and there's a big difference between um, something that's, uh, you know, because of a disability and something that is just an outright behaviour. Isn't that what behaviour support should be asking? They do that too. They would ask that question, but they are more focused on the behaviour. If they recognise it's more to do with a disability, they will refer back to um, um, the school to put in a request for support through our um, complex case or but the request for support. Now, that request for support is not just for teacher aid time. It is also for access to coaches. Who are also employed by the department? Correct, yes. And with the, and I'm, I have to say, I'm sorry if I'm being dense about this, but it often happens, I should tell you. Um, what do the behavioural support people actually do when they get to the school? Um, that's not in my experience, so I really can't speak to that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. In your statement at paragraph... 17, you say currently there is a focus on schools understanding the layers of funding that are provided to support students with disability. In your experience, is it the case, have you experienced that educators and families don't understand those layers of support well? That's correct. And is it your experience that educate, I'm talking about some obviously, educators and families believe that if they get through the EAP and get a verification that the money will come to their child or the resource will come to their child? That's often the understanding, yes. Okay.
And you've spoken about um, in your statement that principals being typically responsible for deciding how resources allocated to the school will be used for all students. And it's correct to say, isn't it, that you, in your position, have um, little influence, that is, you don't have, you can't force your influence on schools as to how resources are allocated. That's correct. Um, and you have experienced occasions on which your recommendations about allocations and, and how the resources are to be allocated have been disregarded. Or how the resources could be used. Yes. So they're really suggestions, not about how they are to be. Yes. So I can only suggest. Okay, but some of those suggestions have not been taken up? That's correct. Okay. Um, and your statement reflects in paragraph 9 that despite you suggesting to schools that they can use their resources flexibly, some may have responded with, quote, that's not fair to the other students who miss out. Can you tell me what that suggestion looks like in practice? Um, so a school, someone from a school may contact... Paragraph a, 19. Um, I, a school may contact me and say... Do you want an example, sorry? Or? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand um, in what context the response might be. That's not fair to the other students who miss out. Yeah. So a school may contact me in terms of, you know, how do we get extra resources... Um, for this particular child, they you know, we're having difficulty. Um, and I may talk to them about uh, how are you using your current allocation? Um, and they would explain to me, uh, I might suggest that they think flexibly about how they use their resources and allocate to the, the students with the highest needs first and you know, less for or none for some of the other students who may not require it, may not require actual face-to-face -face teacher aid time, but to re reallocate that and use it a bit more flexibly with the students who need it more. Um, and occasionally the response is, that's not fair to the other kids. Okay. Can I take you to paragraph 21 of your statement, please? Now, within that statement, you reflect that um, when you believe a school isn't providing a student with appropriate supports, you speak with the principal about their obligations under the policies, procedures and legislation. You speak about sometimes having to escalate it and um, you do so by speaking to the assistant regional director and seeking advice. There's actually no formal requirement on you to escalate, is there? No. So um, if a PEO is aware of a problem like that, that is, comes to the view that a school is not providing appropriate adjustments, there's no obligation on that PEO to escalate. No. That's a, a, I would call it a moral obligation. No, but I'm but talking about not a formal, a formal obligation requirement. on you as part of your work as a PEO that if you form the belief in your, your professional judgment that a student is not being given the adjustments that they need, there's no formal obligation on you to ramp that up. No. You agree with me? Yes. I'm sorry, I use lots of double negatives. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you say you do. And I'm, yeah. not, I'm not doubting would, that. Yeah, I would say most PEOs would do that. Would do that, yes. yes. Um, and but, but again, staff change from time to time and it depends on the skill set, the work capacity. Um, the circumstance that it comes into you as well, yes. that you become made aware of that. So um, if it's a, a, something that comes in from a parent... You, know, you, you do need to, to treat it very seriously because, um, you know, we don't want, we want school to be happy places for students, yes. not, um, yeah, I won't. 
No, that's not okay. unhappy places, but yeah. but so if it comes from a parent, you you, you follow it through to the school, and um, it may come through from the school themselves. Yes, and you try to just give them some some background, some words, some a way of uh, of trying to manage that within their own school. Yes. So so as I understand it, your practice is if you become aware of the issue. House or wherever it comes to you, you'll try to do something about it. Usually, yes. Okay. And that depends on – sorry, I'll just leave it there. I think we've uh, exhausted the point. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I do – I just – I'm mindful, Chair, that I've completely messed up my timing. <laughs> but we will try to get through the balance of the issues. I want to come to part-time attendance – and I've already referred to the fact that there's a part-time educational program guidelines 2020 of this year. Um, and bef- I'll come back to that. But over the past period, that as a PEO, you have seen students being on part-time um, um, arrangements for a number of reasons. Yes. And you, in fact, describe that in your statement in, as mostly being for behaviour under the guise of transition. Yes. How does that work? It's, often it will be um, children coming in in prep who whose behaviour is um, the schools find difficult to manage and so they suggest the transition and in the in the form of part-time attendance with a view to increasing that time and it does not it does not it ha- previously there has been no mechanism to to necessarily try to ensure that that part-time increases to full time. Okay. And you've reflected in your experience some possible views as to why that might be happening. School might not be coping, school might not want to commit additional support, or school might not know how correct to do it. Okay. And your experience in in the past, and I appreciate this is not a precise data analytic, but is that students with autism have been overrepresented in those part-time arrangements. That would be correct, yes. Okay. But there's not consistency about that particular fact across schools? No. Okay. And, indeed, not consistency about the way in which schools and the extent to which schools employ part-time arrangements? No. Okay. And your experience um, in the past has been that there was no formal policy and you described the process as being somewhat organic Organic. You might not use that word. I'll express no. it in a different way. In in the past, without a policy, um, these part-time arrangements might come into being in an informal way. Yes. For example, uh, a school calling the parent in saying, uh, we keep sending your child home at 11 o'clock, let's make that happen from here on. Mm-hmm. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, the policy is new. Uh, 2020. One part of that, um, one part of that policy. I'm sorry. Can we bring up paragraph um, 32 of the statement on the screen? You speak there about your experience about some schools having used part-time attendance because of a student's behaviour and you reflect that having seen one school behaviour records justifying those arrangements but on because of behaviour but on closer scrutiny it appears that there's usually 
an explanation for that behaviour that rests in adjustments or lack of adjustments that have been provided up to that point. Yes. Okay. Are you still seeing that? Yes. Can I have paragraph 33 up, please? You describe in paragraph 33 that some student behaviours are quite extreme, such as throwing chairs and desks, etc. And you speak about it being understandable. Students and staff become nervous and upset as they are not acceptable in any school. But then you say, but in the absence of adjustments and understanding that behaviour is in some instances a way for students to communicate, the behaviours are almost inevitable. And in your experience, some staff can unknowingly exacerbate the anxiety and physical response of some students, thereby providing the excuse to put the student on part-time attendance. Are we still seeing that to some extent now? Um, certainly we're seeing those behaviours uh, without actually going in and interrogating the one school data. I, I really, you know, I had seen it previously Recently, I have not been interrogating to that extent. Okay. Uh, your statement deals in some detail about past circumstances that pre the policy um, that where you become aware that a student is on part-time enrolment and you engage with the principal to find out what's going on, that you have had circumstances where that there was not a plan in place for bringing the child back in uh, to school on a, a greater basis. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've had to um, encourage yes. the principal for that to happen? Yes. Was that advice sometimes not followed through on, to your knowledge? The, second, the cases that I had, they did follow that through. Okay. Uh, are you still seeing, or is it, or is it too early to say since the inception of the guideline? Are you still seeing that issue that there aren't plans in place to bring the child back in? For the most part, there are plans. What's that mean? Um, so the plan is there for for students to increase. Um, whether the increase actually occurs, that's not necessarily. Not necessarily the case. Okay. So is it you've seen some things which indicate to you that the plans may not actually be implemented? No, no. Well, the that the increase may not be happening. Okay. But the plans are in place. Right. But when they do their review, a decision is made not to increase the time at that review. Right. Okay. We probably need a lot of time to, to drill down. Oh, probably would. I'm going to have to leave it. School leavers. Um, sorry, can I just interrupt there? In the um, policy about part-time enrolment, you give in, there's an example of uh, a boy, girl, child called Corbin, who's been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and... Um, in order to help this child adjust to going to school. There's an agreement he'll start school, he or she will start school part-time initially and then increase attendance over the next four weeks. Uh, what you, is what you're talking about where that increase um, doesn't happen? That's correct. Thanks. Uh, may I reflect on the record that your statement does with respect to the case of Jack we heard about this morning speak to a number of areas in which you identify might have been done differently. I, I want to, in my remaining time, and Chair, I'm going to ask for some indulgence for six, to go a little bit past one, but I'll keep it as short as I can. You can, you can have the six minutes that my interventions took so as to erase any possible problem it may have caused. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Can I have paragraph 47 up on the screen, please? In your statement, you say that you'd like to see change in universities. And I want to take you to the last part of that paragraph. You say, I have seen the look on the faces of pre-service teachers when they realise that they are going to have students with disability in their classes. They know they are not prepared for it. Are you still seeing that? I uh, made that statement based on the fact that in when I was in North Queensland, I provided a guest lecture at James Cook University each year and spoke in front of pre-service teachers. Um, I have not done that since 2018, so I can't say that I'm still seeing that. Okay, all right, but that's certainly the perception you had at that at point. At that time. Okay, and it's certainly something which resonated with you sufficiently to say we need that you'd like to see more preparedness at university stage for our teachers. Yes. Okay. Now, excuse me for one minute. Can you uh, let me know whether or not, um, in respect of the restrictive practices document which has been released by the department this year, have you received specific training in that? Yes. Okay. Do you know whether that training has been rolled across to all educators within Queensland? I couldn't answer that. Okay. Can I ask you also, with respect to the student code of conduct requirements which operate from 2020, um, whether you are aware of the extent to which um, schools have incorporated the mandate about preventing and ex and um, preventing um, bullying? So could you repeat the question, please? Um, do you know the extent to which or whether schools have, in fact, to your knowledge and experience, um, incorporated the mandate in the student code of conduct requirements for the prevention of bullying? I don't have um, knowledge of that. Okay, thank you. Is it the in your experience that there still currently is not um, very clear processes to ensure consistency of implementation of adjustments in Queensland schools? Um, there is not consistency. That's correct. Um, and again, it comes down to school level. It comes to school level and teacher level, yes. Okay. I think that's all I can do. Um, with my six minutes, commissioners, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hand to the commissioners, uh, please. I'll, thank you. I'll inquire whether uh, commissioners have questions. Commissioner Gelbley. Um, thank you. I'd like to just ask a little more about when there's a plan to increase children's time from part time, and it's not that not, there's no action on that plan. What, in your experience, what are the reasons for that? To be honest, I don't. I haven't been given those reasons. Often, I'm told that by parents that that's the case, but um, I'm sorry, I can't speak to the reasons. And there's no monitoring and reporting on that, I take um, it. There, now there is, under the new guidelines, there will be monitoring if the, if the part-time attendance um, is to extend past 10 weeks, then 
Um, the principle is to speak with the assistant regional director about the circumstances around that. So that will be the monitoring point. And the third question, can, uh, is there a mechanism for parents to raise concerns and complain about that um, if they think it's unfair and inappropriate? Uh, yes, they can come to region. Right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mason, do you have any questions? Um, I was just going to ask you a general question. Um, thank you very much for coming today to speak to us. Um, I'm interested in First Nations students with disabilities and just in your experience around the, uh, the benefit of taking advantage of the supports available for First Nations children with disabilities in schools just in your experience and what you've seen and observed over the years, um, is that take up commensurate with what we generally know as the level of disability across uh, young people in the community, particularly here in Queensland? Um, are we tracking well or um, is there much work to do in regards to families and students taking advantage of what's available? I think... Um from my, in my experience, schools are very good at um, identifying students, both First Nations students and um, others, and trying to um, support the families to, I guess, have identified specific issues. There, there does not have to be any diagnosis of any disability, but a recognition of, um, you know, the fact that a student may have even an implied dis disability, an imputed disability. Um, so I, I think the schools actually do pick that up. I am not sure whether they rely or they they assign support more through the First Nations um, within school or through the disability side within schools? Is that what you were asking? Yes, because um, uh, people who do work in uh, the uh, in services and supports for First Nations uh, children in schools often um, talk about they are often seen as choosing between disability or First Nations, and to me this is the interesting question around intersectionality and actually the, the, the interconnection is actually the, the question as opposed to either or, it's actually together yes. because the experience of then leaving school means that it's a stronger transition out as opposed to the choice. And I think it's like everything else we do, some schools do it really well and some don't. Commissioner Atkinson? No, thank you. No questions. Ms Theodore, just, just one more thing from me. In your paragraph 32, to which uh, Dr Melifont took you, you said, I've seen one school behaviour records which do, uh, justify this arrangement of part-time attendance because of the behaviour, but on closer scrutiny, there is usually an explanation for the behaviour. How do you know from the records whether something might need further expo explanation or exploration? Um, that's probably an experience thing. So over time, you, we tend to, the, the PEOs and regional staff tend to interrogate what is on one school um, and experience in the area of disability, uh, we can recognise when behaviours are exacerbated because of something that someone may be doing. And, and I guess the best way is to describe an example where I've read a student was what they call trashing the classroom, throwing everything off the shelves. And the agreed plan was that the teacher aide would shadow the student and calmly speak to them and tell them what they need to do. Um, 
And when you when you followed that um, the entire explanation of what happened, that just caused to keep the student um, carrying out that that behaviour. And it was only when they they pulled back that the students stopped. So in fact, you could see that that may not have been the correct adjustment for that student in that circumstance. And you could tell this from the one school uh, information itself. You didn't have to go further. No, that's correct. I, it, it, they record very well on one school. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms Theodore, for attending and giving evidence. I'm sorry we've kept you a little longer, as Dr Melifont will confirm. It's entirely my fault, but uh, now you are free to go and have uh, some lunch. Thank you very much. We will adjourn now, which is at uh, 1.10, I believe, Brisbane time, and resume at 2 p.m. Is that convenient, uh, Dr Melifont? Yes, it is, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. <laughs>
uh, and it's a paragraph 10. You also con conducted cognitive assessments. Yes. And you interpreted them to determine if a student met the EAP criteria. Yes. Um, you also did work in critical incident management and planning in response to death and suicide. Yes. And you provided advice about how to best work with students with challenging behaviours and disabilities. Yes, advice and support on the ground in the schools, meeting with parents. Okay. That, that's a, a snapshot, isn't it? Yes. It was a very big job. Yes. Okay. In your uh, statement, you explain how guidance officers and senior guidance officers are involved in the EAP verification process. Can you give me a, a summary of what that mm -hmm. is, please? <clears throat> the only verification categories that we are involved in is intellectual disability and speech language impairment, and that is um, looking at the criteria of uh, meeting a category for verification, doing the um, assessments required, the cognitive and adaptive behaviour assessments to uh, see where the student's cognitive functioning is, and then working with staff, uh, maybe speech pathologists as well, uh, to work out what adjustments are required for that student to access education on the same basis as the other students. Okay. And... In your experience, um, what scope was there for parents or for caregivers to um, challenge a decision declining an EAP verification? Parents <clears throat> don't have to have uh, verification. It is totally up to them. They, don't, they need to sign to say that they do want their students assessed. And so the guidance officer would explain to them what that means and what that entails. If they're not happy with it, they don't go ahead with it, and many parents don't, or yes. some parents don't. If there is a an assessment done and the parents challenge the outcome of that assessment uh, at a meeting later on with the guidance officer and the student going through what the what the meaning is and looking at breaking it down to see what it means, they can, they're very welcome to go to the senior guidance officer to get further information, go to another specialist, or just have more discussion about what it means. And mostly it's about parents being concerned that their child is labelled for life with a disability and what that will mean for them in the future. And so usually once we allay their fears and say this is not a diagnosis, we're not diagnosing anything, we're just seeing if you meet criteria so that you can get um, support and, and educational adjustments, once they understand that, Generally, that's okay. A lot of parents think that once their child is labelled, that, you know, when they leave school, it's kind of on their record forever, that they have an intellectual disability. And that's not the case. But it is a concern that we understand. All right. So what, are, what we understand to be the position that is that if a student does receive an EAP verification, that does not necessarily, well, that does not mean that funding or resource comes directly to the student, but rather it comes into the school. That's correct. Okay. In your experience in interacting <coughs> with parents, was it your experience that parents thought that if they went through the verification process, got the verification, that the funding would come to or the resource would come to their child? Some parents did think that, and that's how it used to be years and years ago when it was called ascertainment before it was called verification. And so there's a little bit of a hangover from that. But generally, I think most parents understand that it doesn't go directly to their child. All right. Uh, can I ask you to, uh, what period of time were you a senior guidance officer for? for? The last five years before I retired. All right. Thank you. Now, it's your understanding, isn't it, that there are um, that students with disabilities don't necessarily fall within an EAP category, correct? Yes. And this can include, um, that is, students who don't fall within those categories can include um, 
severe mental health issues, learning disabilities, brain injuries and social emotional disorders. Yes. Is that correct? Thank you. Now, was it your understanding when working for the department that WSS SLR, which is Whole School Support Student Learning Resources, was it your understanding that money from there was to be limited to students with disabilities? No. Okay. Whole of, did you understand it to come in as whole of school to be spent according to how the principal decided? Yes, for support for all students. Okay. Uh, in your statement at paragraph 29, you speak of principals being required to um, submit a spreadsheet, and this is principals in the metropolitan region, be required to submit a spreadsheet to regional office with a number of staff, such as guidance officers, therapists and other support staff. They will be staffing in their schools using WSS SLR. Are you aware um, of there being any requirement for principals um, to report um, that funds um, brought into the school are used specifically for disability? No. Okay. In the course of your work, did you observe there to be gaps in support? Yes. Related to, to funding? Well, definitely, yes. Okay. In what respect? Or well, the funding, the, the funding for supporting all students, so it includes students with disability, students in out-of-home care, students uh, from First, First Nations, refugee students, students from non-English speaking backgrounds, all of those students were included. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes schools would decide that an extra deputy principal or an extra head of department or an extra some other bureau, bureaucratic position in the school would best support those students and the funding would be used for that. Okay. Was it your, did you form the view in, in the course of your work as a senior guidance officer and guidance officer for that manner, matter um, that schools struggled with anything social, social or emotional in respect of supports which were needed? Yes. Uh, you mean support for students with social and emotional needs? Yes, I do. I'm yes, sorry if I yes. badly expressed question. That's exactly what I mean. Can you can you tell me what your experience was? Yes, students with um, mental illness in particular or social needs, uh, specific social needs, students from traumatic backgrounds, uh, ch children from out of care who generally have a history of trauma, Schools did struggle with that, particularly if they couldn't if, if they couldn't easily put a label of disability on it, they would think, well, we don't have there's nothing we can do. Also, there's a lot of fear about mental illness and trauma. Sco schools, a lot of teachers in schools and principals don't feel that they have the skills or ability to understand and deal with that, and they're fearful of what might happen. They're extremely fearful of a student self-harming while they're at school because not only the risk to the student and the other students, but the impact on their school right. of that so happening. Just, can I just hold you there for yeah. one moment? J just to observe, Commissioner, I should have said this a couple of minutes ago, that some of the content of this evidence does mention suicide mm -hmm. and self-harm. And, and to reflect back on the warnings that we have been given throughout the week, that some of the evidence that will be heard can be concerning and upsetting and that there are uh, places to go to for help, which are, of course, on our website. But we will be on this topic for a few minutes, so people who might find it upsetting <coughs> might wish to turn off the web stream for just a little while. Sorry to interrupt. That's that was right. my fault. I should have done that before. Okay. 
Do you want to continue? Or you want... No. Okay. So um, can you tell me whether it was your experience, um, did you come across circumstances in which um, children expressing suicidal ideation and or self-harm um, were sent home with instructions to the parents or caregivers not to come back so they got a letter from their psychologist stating that they won't kill themselves frequently. Uh, okay. Now, you're aware of something called regional complex case funding? Yes. Is that what we call a complex needs application? Yes. Is that how you knew that that term? We've heard it called something else different. I knew of it, Brisbane. yes. I knew of it as complex case application. Okay. And your understanding of the circumstances in which you could make such an application, please? Any situation where the school felt that they were unable to meet the needs of the student and they needed extra resources. Did you have to or did you make such applications in the course of your work? It, the area that I worked in, it had to be... Um, involved, there had to be a senior guidance officer involved in the application, but it was signed off by the principal. So I frequently filled out the application and uh, forwarded it to the principal and they signed it and submitted it. And then there was a panel in regional office to examine the application and I was usually there at the table to explain in more detail the situation. And respect with respect in particular to students with disabilities, in respect of such applications as you're aware of, mm -hmm. did you come across occasions where those applications were knocked back? Yes. And were there emerging reasons or themes in the reasons coming back for the refusals? Yes. What were they? Um, frequently it was that the, that the manager making the decision would look at the financial position of the school and say, well, they've got so much money underspent in their budget anyway, they can easily afford to meet this need themselves out of their own money. Uh, other, other cases, it could be that the school has asked for too much money. Other cases, it could be that the school may not have a very good history of meeting the needs of students with disability and they need to learn to do that. See. So. Uh, now your statement talks. Your statement speaks about a large part of your role involved um, acting as the case manager for students who have been proposed for exclusion. Yes. And that was the case in reality, although not part of your role description. Yes. Okay. Um, and when we use exclusion here, we're talking about expulsion. Yes. Okay. What was your involvement in that process? <clears throat> well, I would receive an email automatic, automatically generated from one school, the database platform the Education Department uses, uh, just telling me that I've been allocated as a case manager for a student, and then I would usually not receive anything further from the school, so I would have to get into one school, have a look at what the documented situation was. Sometimes I knew these students already because they had been complex and I'd been involved in talking with guidance officers about them in their supervision. But I would just uh, have a look at the situation, look at the history, look at their um, adjustments if they had disability, whether they were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and so get as much of a picture as I could about the student. And then after a couple of days, after the family had had time to come to terms with what had happened, I would contact the family, meet with them, the student and their family, and we would, I'd ask the student to tell me what, in their words, what happened. And then we would go about the process of wh whatever they wanted me to do. And usually it was to just explain what, what happens now, you know, what the time frame is, what's likely to occur, um, that they needed to provide additional information back to the school within five days if they wanted the principal to 
consider that in his or her decision about whether they go ahead with the exclusion. So I would sometimes help them write an email or I'd come along to a meeting at the school with them to support them. And then we would have to wait until the decision was made. And so the student was usually suspended for 20 days, but sometimes it took the school five days to even assess all of the information and suspend them. So they could have been home for a week already. So we'd wait for the 20 days and then wait for the outcome. And I would have prepared the family and been in contact with them during that 20 days anyway uh, about where to, what, what should we do? Think about what happens if you go back, what do we need to do differently? If you can't go back to that school, what will we do? And outline their options and okay. meet with them again. All right. Let me just break down a couple of yeah. those things. So um, the step involved, the process involved, um, a notice being issued by the principal of possible um, exclusion, yes. correct? The student will be suspended pending that final decision. Yes. Um, 20 days to make the decision for the principal. Yes. What was your experience as to how much of that time would ordinarily run before you'd get a decision from the principal? Usually. 20 days. Right, so right towards the end or? Usually. Okay. Um, and so a student who, in that process, can um, this, can you start to take steps to find another school just in case the student does get excluded? Families try to do that yeah. and they get turned away from any prospective school because they're still enrolled and there's no decision made. I, tr I have tried to approach principals of other schools early if I know that the family's not really keen to go back to that school anyway, even if the ex exclusion doesn't go ahead, to have a fresh start. But they're not interested unless they know the outcome of the exclusion. So we really have no choice but to wait unless the families go to a private school. And that has sometimes been the case. They've just moved into the independent sector or okay. Catholic sector. Can I take you now to the situation where the, the principal does decide um, to exclude. Mm -hmm. And so you you have a role then in trying to help the student enrol into a new school, is that correct? Yes. And in that respect, you would make referrals and try to support the new enrolment at the new school? Yes. As you saw fit? Yes. Well, during the suspension period, the 20 days, I would have made referrals to external agencies for support if the family needed that and the student wanted that. So, yes, after the 20 days, we would look at what school, what local schools, and it depends on siblings and parents' working arrangements. And so I would usually take their first choice and then I would approach the principal of that school and provide all of the information transparently, uh, the one school record for the student and request consideration for enrolment. Okay. Um. In the course of your work, obviously, you'll have different attitudes from different schools depending on principles, correct? Yes. And some do it well, some do it not so well. Yes. Okay. So um, it, did you experience in the course of your work trying to get students re-enrolled any reluctance by some schools or principals to do so? Usually that's the case. And what reasons did you see com commonly um, Sorry, what reasons were you commonly given for um, that reluctance? Well, usually the reluctance started by not returning my phone calls or emails, and so I'd just have to wait. So it often took a couple of weeks even to get any response at all. But I must say some principals were very quick off the mark and said, yes, I've got to take this one, no doubt, and bring it on and let's make a meeting. But you, that, was, that was rare for me in the area that I worked in. But I'm only secondary too. It's a little bit different in primary. Uh, usually the answer was that year level is full for us or um, we have th – that it's too far away. We, that is not the next local school. We would, we're not the closest after the excluded school or we've already taken five or six exclusions this year and we haven't excluded anyone or we've only excluded two. It's, it's trying to weigh the balance. So, you know, pick somebody else. Or it was 
sometimes, more often than I would like to like it to be, we don't have the resources to support that student. Okay. Um, in your experience for students with um, disability, and again, I don't wish to generalise, but but some students with disability at least, um, did you observe such students who had been excluded having difficulty in reintegration into a new school? Yes, it, it's traumatic. It is absolutely traumatic for the student because they already feel that there's something wrong with them anyway. When they lose their school, they're broken. The kids are absolutely broken and it's heart-wrenching. The family is in tears. The kids are crying. They have no idea really what what's happened and, and where to from here. The families have usually are at the point of total disempowerment and disengagement from the school because they've tried everything and it hasn't worked. When they started a new school, everything's different. They have no um, kids that they know generally. The, the whole system is different. The structure of the school is different. The, the rules quite often are different. The uniform. And it, it is very traumatic. And then usually if they have a disability, normally the school wants to start them off on a part-time attendance to see how they go. And so that interferes then with the parents' work arrangements on top of the suspension that they've had. And it, it's just very complex for everyone. So if a kid at a high school is only working a part-time timetable where they're only there until, say, midday. Not every day is exactly the same in a high school. So they might go to English on Monday and then not have English again on until Friday. So they haven't done their homework because they didn't even know there was homework. So that makes it even harder for them because they're behind already, even if they start fresh and think, oh, I'll be OK, I'll be able to do it. OK, thank you. Okay. If, you've, if a student's been excluded, then senior guidance officers um, are to, to check on that at three months and six months, correct? Yes, yes. But there's no obligation to do so beyond that? No. OK. And to your understanding at the time, there was no mandatory obligation on, say, a flexi school or some other alternate path that the student might have gone into to notify the school, the first school, um, or the department if they dropped out of that no, well, they wouldn't do that because that would be a breach of confidentiality. It's a different system. Okay, I understand. Badly asked question. So um, if you are to keep up with excluded students to see where they are at three months and six months, okay, um, in that period of time to start with, was there, to your understanding, a mandatory oblig obligation on, say, a flexi school that the student was... Uh, uh, was going to in the meantime to tell you, actually, they're, they're not coming to Flexi School either. No, they wouldn't tell me anything because of the privacy restrictions. Right. So I, I would, I would contact the families. That's what I did in yeah. the first instance. Anyway, contact the families to see how they're going because you don't always get exact information from schools or whoever you talk to might know. So chasing up the family is the way to follow that up right. for me. Thank you. Excuse me just for just a moment. Balance of the material is in the statement. You're okay with me to pull up here. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Ms. Hallett, I want to thank you for your comprehensive statement, which does contain a lot more information than we've gone through today here. Um, can I just ask if the commissioners have any further questions for you? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Atkinson? No, thank you. Commissioner Mason. No, thank you. And Commissioner Galbraith. Um, I just wanted to ask the question about the student going to the new school, um, the decision to have them only come part-time uh, that seems like the continuation of an exclusion, of a part-time exclusion. How are those decisions made and on what basis? Those decisions are presented to the family on enrolment 
as a way of transitioning the student into a new environment in a, uh, a less anxiety-provoking way. That's how it's presented. But it's your... And families... You, sorry, you go on. Families are usually so pleased to actually get an acceptance of an enrolment into a new school, they're prepared to agree to anything at that point. Thank you. In uh, paragraph 43, uh, Ms Howlett, you say that while students are suspended awaiting the outcome of the exclusion decision, the school is required to provide curriculum work to the student at home. Where does that requirement come from? That That is in the policy of um, the Education Department of Queensland about exclusions and suspensions and school disciplinary absences, that students' education cannot be negatively impacted uh, by suspensions and exclusions. That's one of the statements in that policy. You then go on to say that in your experience this rarely occurs, uh, extending to sometimes emailing worksheets. What's the experience uh, that you use as the basis for that statement? Well, usually after the student has been suspended for a couple of weeks and they still haven't heard about the exclusion, they start getting really worried about their exams and their assignments and so do the parents. And so they contact me and say, we haven't got any work. There were exams, there were assignments due. We haven't heard anything from the school. And they say, we've, we've rung, we've asked, can you help us? And so I then email and call the school and I try to get some work sent home as well. So in those cases, the school has not in fact provided the excluded student with work for that student to do at home? That's right. What then happens as far as the failure of the school to comply with the departmental policy? Nothing happens. Thank you. That's a pretty clear answer. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms Howlett, for your appearance today and for giving evidence to the Royal Commission. We appreciate your assistance and appreciate the statement that you've provided to us. Thank you. Dr Mellifont, what, what is to happen now? A uh, three-minute adjournment, please, whilst we reorient the hearing room up here. Thank you. We'll adjourn for a short time uh, to allow uh, the changes to take place. And thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned.
Stimmt. Good afternoon, Chair. Can't hear you. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. In that case, Dr. Malafont. <laughs> thank you. The, the next witness is Emma Haythorpe. Um, we are grateful she's here with us in person in Brisbane. You'll find the statement of Ms. Haythorpe at Tender Bundle C, Volume 1, Tab 1. I tender that statement and ask it be marked as Exhibit 7.165. There is one in extra to that statement. I ask it be tendered and marked 7.165.1. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haythorpe, for attending today to give um, evidence. Would you be good enough, please, to follow the instructions that will be given to you uh, by Commissioner Atkinson's associate for the purposes of taking the affirmation? Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Haythorpe. Uh, Dr. Melifont, uh, who I think is in the same room as you, will ask you some questions now. I am. Thank you. Your full name, please. Emma Louise Haythorpe. And you have a Bachelor of Education in Psychology, you are a registered teacher, a registered psychologist, and an ARPA board approved supervisor for psychology interns, and you're able to provide clinical and technical supervision to psychologists, correct? Yes. Um, your first job uh, with the school after your studies was as Head of Special Education Services at, uh, at Bowen, correct? Uh, and you held that role from 99 through 2003, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, in that role, you were responsible for teaching and coordinating the special education needs for 26 students aged 4 through 15. Yes. Okay. So we're going to let you, we're going to need you to speak up just oh, a yes, little okay. bit. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um and from 2005, you worked for Child Youth Mental Health Service in Townsville. Yes. And in 2009, you were employed as a guidance officer with the Department of Education. Yes. Okay. Now, a guidance officer, um, generally the role in brief terms? Um, counselling, crisis counselling in the particular school that I was at, um, enrolment interviews, um, academic uh, IQ and adaptive behaviour assessments for the um, verification process with the EAP, um, notifications to child safety, that sort of uh, um, subject selection and university course selection. It was a large role. Okay. And work with respect to enrolments? Yeah, every morning, two enrolments every morning. Okay. In 2012, you started working at the ACT Department of Education as a school psychologist. Yes. And your role in 2017 was as a senior guidance officer for Queensland Education. Yes. And that was in Brisbane and Ipswich. Yes. And you had under your supervision nine guidance officers across seven schools. Yes. Um, we left, oh, sorry, and you, you left Queensland Education in August of 2017. Yes. Okay. And um, for your sins, you are doing a law degree. Yes. And you're in your final year. Yes, I am. Okay. Why did you leave the department? Um, I really disagreed with the practices around excluding students and the difficulties that the, um, my fellow guidance, senior guidance officers and I um, had with trying to enrol the students in another school. And um, just that, that consumed the role and it, it took away from my ability and time that I could spend doing you know, proper supervision of the guidance officers, which was very much required. The case management for the complex cases after exclusions took up about 90% of my time, and even more so because of the amount of um, the difficulties of trying to get principals to accept their enrolments. Okay. 
Now, you set out the roles in which you were involved in um, EAP applications in your statement, but in short, it was in the role of hoses, in the role of guidance officer and as a senior guidance officer. Yeah. Okay. And the EAP application was complete, in your experience, ordinary completed with a hoses or a special education teacher. Okay. Now, we've, we've heard a number of times in the Commission there's six categories, students uh, with a disability may not fall within those categories. Um, so what about students, in your experience, students with complex behavioural disorders or mental health diagnosis, such as um, students with oppositional defiance disorder or ADHD? They were left. So, and by that you mean they didn't fall within the They didn't the fall in within the category, so they didn't get support. I think the guidance officers who might have been able to offer support were too busy doing other things, and so they probably didn't have access to guidance officers to support, you know, their mental health conditions, or the guidance officers would be consumed with crisis counselling. Um, and so that those students would have complex needs that would never be met, which means they would have complex behaviours which would lead to expo um, expulsion and the cycle continues. Okay. Now, you use language of generality, mm -hmm. but do you mean to express by that in some cases these things didn't happen? Okay. Where would you put it on the, on the range of none through to all of the time? I would say all of the time. In my experience, short amount of experience, 10 months in that role, it was overwhelming. Okay. And it might be a marker of the district that I was in. Um, it might, and when my role in other, like, districts, it wasn't that bad. So okay. that might be a marker of the area that I was in. Okay. Uh, this... Uh, EAP six category, um, did you observe it to have an impact in respect of approach to diagnoses? Yes. And what specifically was that? Well, in regards to intellectual impairment, it meant that I think uh, deputy principals would put a lot of pressure on guidance officers to assess to try and squish kids into a category and so there would be over assessment and IQ assessment shouldn't be done frequently um, and so you would come across students who had had too much exposure to the testing um, and if you didn't fall within that category well then you didn't get the funding and then you were sort of left. Okay and you, you're aware of a particular instance where a child uh, received a diagnosis of autism where, in your view, um, a better diagnosis, a more accurate one, would have been uh, a different diagnosis. Absolutely. Okay, a diagnosis which didn't fall within the categories. Yes. Okay. Um, and in your experience as a psychologist, one of the you would regard one of the adverse consequences of an incorrect diagnosis is that they might be exposed to labels. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, we just have to pick it up for the transcript, okay? Um, and they might get treatments which aren't appropriate for them. Yes. Okay. And a perception of themselves that is different to what is accurate, I think, more importantly as well. Okay, perception of self, did yeah. you say? All right. Now, in that EAP work as a senior guidance officer, one of the things you needed to do were was a having trouble with my singular and plural a psycho educational assessment for yes. the EAP process. Yes. And how long might that take up? For well, I'm experienced in them, and so from woe to go, I could probably do that in about two days. But inexperienced guidance officers, it can take weeks. Okay, so for you, it was two full days. Two work, full days. Sometimes one more. assessment. Yeah. Sorry, we're speaking across each other. Let me just make sure I've got it. Two full days, perhaps more, for one assessment. Yes. 
Now, part of your um, role was case managing the complex cases associated with school exclusions. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And what would trigger your involvement in an exclusion? We would get an email alerting um, that a student was proposed for expulsion. Um, and so then we would just have to wait and see if that expulsion was going to be followed through. Um, so it was a monitoring sort of a situation for a few weeks. Um, in that time, probably make contact with the parent. I would look at the catchment area and um, try and work out where their location is, the next three closest schools, transport. Um, I would work it out via car, via public transport and all that type of stuff and prepare an email up to the three closest school principals to let them know, to be aware that this student has been proposed for expulsion. I'm going, I may approach you shortly to see if this student can enrol. Okay. So part of your role would be to try to guide uh, families through an appeal? Yes, if that's what they wanted to do. If that's what they wanted to do. Okay. And you and while whilst you were there, your experience is that exclusion decisions would usually be taken by the principal? Yes. Okay. Um, now you speak to some particular examples. Um in your statement as to the level of discretion you observe uh, principals to have. Uh, you speak of exclusion of A students for verbal misconduct, a student with an intellectual impairment, and um, that exclusion stood despite a letter of apology from the student. Uh, and to, to you, and again, it's an expert, sorry, no, no, sorry, I haven't finished the sentence. To you, you regarded that particular expulsion as being a disproportionate response? Absolutely. Why? Because it was swearing. The boy had an intellectual impairment. That's quite a severe intellectual impairment. Um, and I just thought that that was too much considered how much the dad and the son worked, the apology that they made, how sincere they were, and the detrimental effect of going to another school for that student. That school was within walking distance. The other siblings were at that school. The father didn't have transport. It was, you know, too much. And was was there IQ testing done for that student? Yes. And what did it reveal to your recollection? It was very, extremely low. Okay. Low, like you don't come across that low very often. Like 60? Yes. Six zero? Yes. Is, is that what... It was in this case. Were there any adjustments um, for that? Were there any adjustments for that child? It's uh, the chair here speaking to you from Sydney. Uh, were there any adjustments for that child in the school before uh, his expulsion? Well, he was under an EAP process plan, um, and so he would have had he had access to the special education unit. So. Yes, he did formally have that, but I don't know if the supports were adequate. Did, to your knowledge, anybody investigate whether the supports were adequate before an expulsion decision was made? No, they wouldn't, no. no. And that was part of the, you know, writing the letter. You're saying that you know from your knowledge that there was no consideration of the extent to which supports were provided? No. Yes. You're agreeing with me, in other words, it's just as you've said. I do no. agree with you. <laughs> okay, Sorry. Thank you. Yes, I please. want to turn to a, another topic, and your statement obviously deals with a lot more things in more detail than we're able to do here. Uh, but you speak about being involved in the process for re-enrolment. Yes. And so you would identify the next closest school mm -hmm. after an exclusion and arrange an interview, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And did you observe any any uh, trend or a general theme in terms of um, the school's timeliness responding to your request? Absolutely. And what were they? Delay, delay, refusal. There was only one school that I worked with that said, yes, get the family to ring me, we'll put in an appointment next week. Okay. Did you experience occasions on which 
you were told that an enrolment interview would be granted um, if another school took another student. Yes. Um, and you've experienced in some circumstances getting through those steps, getting a child re-enrolled, but still condition, conditions being placed on enrolment? Definitely, yes. Such as? Um, we won't accept that student. A lot of no, absolutely no, until I elevated it two levels above myself. Um, and then the principal realised that there was a court order for that student that said that he had to be at school. Um, and so it was only once it had been elevated and she realised that the student had a court order to say that he had to go to school, that she started to agree. Um, and then she said would only accept the child if he had a reduced timetable and the complex case funding was given to the school. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in your um, statement, you do set out your, your hope for this Royal Commission mm -hmm. And uh, that's in your statement. I just might reflect that that includes a recognition of a of a broader range of disabilities. Absolutely, please. And for greater flexibility to be taken in respect of um, approach to towards education of students with disability. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, um, commissioners. That is all I have to ask Miss Haythorpe about here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll ask commissioners if they have any uh, questions, commencing with Commissioner Atkinson. No, I have no questions except to wish um, Ms Haythorpe good luck in her new chosen career. Thank you. Commissioner Mason. No, thank you. Commissioner Galbally. Um, would it have been um, better from your point of view if there was less discretion um, from principals about the entry of the child who'd been excluded into the new school? Yes, definitely. And less discretion for principals to actually exclude. Thank you. Uh, Ms Haythorpe, uh, thank you very much for coming and giving evidence. I too wish you uh, success in your final year of studies in law and in what I hope for you will be a successful and rewarding career in that best of all professions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No bias there. <laughs> None uh, no. Might, might we have an adjournment, please, until uh, 10 past 3 Queensland time? Yes, we can do that. We'll adjourn until 10 past 3 Queensland time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Dr. Melifont. Thank you. The next witness today is Professor Linda Graham. Professor Graham is present in the hearing room in Brisbane. Her statement is at Tender Bundle B, Volume 1, Tab 3. I tender that statement and ask it be marked as Exhibit 7.167 and Negge's uh, to Professor Graham's statement uh, are at volume, Tender Bundle D, Volume 2, Tabs 11 through 26, and I ask that they be marked as 7.167.1 through to 7.167.16. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. Professor Graham, thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence today. Um, you are, I think, in the Brisbane hearing room. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of uh, the uh, uh, associate to uh, Commissioner Atkinson and she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you, uh, Professor Graham. Uh, I, Dr. Melifont will now ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Could you state your full name, please? Linda Jane Graham. 
and you've made an 83-page statement dated the 29th of September 2020. Yes. Could have been much longer, but you had to stop somewhere. It could be a lot longer. <laughs> okay. All right. Are the contents of the statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Okay. You are a professor and director of the Centre for Inclusive Education at QUT? Yes. And over the course of your research work, you have conducted multi-jurisdictional research focusing on the role of educational policy and schooling practices in the development of disruptive student behaviour and the improvement of responses to children with learning and behavioural difficulties. Yes. You attached a CV to your statement, which was a little out of date, and you've now provided an updated one to the Commission. Is that correct? Yes, it and changes I, often. <laughs> I'm sorry? It changes often. Yes, of course. Uh, and I, I can advise the Commission that the CV which has been tendered is the updated version. Uh, in brief terms, you're currently working on a project uh, I have multiple projects. Um, one of them is a six-year longitudinal study that we're closing at the moment, which has been investigating the development of severely disruptive behaviour. We've been following 250 children from prep to grades um, five uh, from seven primary schools in Queensland. We have a new study uh, also funded by the Australian Research Council, which is testing whether accessible pedagogies and assessment practices lead to improved outcomes for all students, but especially those with language and attentional difficulties. And I'm also chairing uh, the inquiry into suspension, exclusion and expulsion processes in South Australian government schools. Uh, that is almost finished. The uh, terms of reference are very broad, and they're looking at like over-representation of at-risk groups, uh, whether legislation policy and procedure is being followed, whether there's a need for um, a separate education ombudsman and lots more. Um, and that report is due to be provided to the Education Minister on the 26th of October 2020. Uh, and I believe that it will be tabled in Parliament on the 25th of November 2020. All right. Busy times. In your research over the years, um, there have been two broad focuses. First, exclusion, or rather who, sorry, how and who schools exclude. Mm. And secondly, practices to support inclusion uh, particularly for students commonly described as being in the grey zone. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, your statement defines a number of key concepts, including exclusionary discipline, formal exclusion, informal exclusion, suspensions and expulsions. Now, the commissioners obviously, obviously have read your statement, but I want to uh, ask you about a couple of terms, and that is Macro and micro exclusions, what do those terms mean? Uh, the way that I'm defining those or using those is that macro exclusion is like suspension and, and so on where you're out of school. Micro exclusions can be like when you're sent out of class, um, but it can also mean when you are shut out of learning, um, when, for example, adjustments are not being made to enable you to access the curriculum or pedagogy. Okay. When you speak of informal exclusion, what do you mean by that? Um, so that's the ubiquitous phone call home, um, usually to mum, uh, which is come and pick up Johnny, he's had enough for the day. Um, it can also be a private negotiation between uh, the principal and the parents or carers, uh, which is about... We've only got enough teacher aid time for, you know, a couple of days a week, sometimes even a couple of hours a day or not even that, um, you know, and keep your child at home until, um, you know, and you look after them basically um, until we can have them. Um, it can also be, you know, sort of suspensions that aren't recorded and, and parents are often told that that is 
uh, for the benefit of their child so that they don't um, get a record uh, when often it's really to disguise the school's uh, exclusionary record um, and so that that information doesn't leak up. Okay, so they're the types of things that you're referring to yeah. when you speak about informal exclusions, correct? Yes, okay. So I just need to get to say res yes for the yep, transcript. Sorry, yes. Okay. Now, you've undertaken research into the causes of micro-exclusions. I have. Um, I didn't set out to research that, and actually this research um, informs the new study that we have started. Um, what I actually set out to, to do was to address conflict and to work with teachers around de-escalation, like prevention of conflict and de-escalation, because uh, conflict results from you know, disengagement and things happening in the classroom, and it's kind of the end point um, just before things like exclusion and so on happen. And I was approached to begin this project um, by a, an acting school principal who came to me because she wanted to change how things were done in her school and it was the exclusion of an, uh, a 15-year-old Indigenous boy in her school um, and the chain of events that led up to that that made her want to do something differently. So we collaboratively designed this project. It was funded by the Queensland Government and... Um, and it involved talking, we surveyed a 1,000 um, students from years 7 to 10 across uh, three pretty disadvantaged um, high schools. And then we asked the principals of those high schools to tell us who was at the, you know, the red tip pointy end of the behaviour triangle. And, uh, and we interviewed 50 of them. And what we found when we talked to them, which actually worked out um, pretty good in the end because we actually couldn't get any teachers to participate in the project uh, around uh, de-escalation of conflict. What we discovered was the students were telling us that they actually do want to learn, contrary to what a lot of people might say about these kids, but they actually do want to learn, but they find learning very difficult. And Conflict happens when that isn't understood and when that's perceived through the lens of uh, doesn't care, couldn't be bothered um, and so on. And so I'm talking about simple things where, for example, students would say, like we asked them, um, what makes an excellent teacher? And their answers were not what people think which is teachers that make things fun. There were a few responses like that. But the majority said teachers who help, teachers who support, teachers who explain things well, teachers who take the time to explain them again and who don't make you feel bad or uh, get you in trouble for needing them to do that. Okay. So that project was called the Recent Education Horizon Project, yes? Mm. Okay. And... Part of its findings were that classroom conflict and disengagement occur when the students experience barriers due to a lack of adjustments and reactive behaviour behavior management practices. Is that correct? Yes. And what do you mean by that phrase, reactive behaviour management practices? So to explain that, first I have to say what we should do, which is proactive, and proactive behaviour management strategies are anticipatory. Um, and basically teachers use strategies like pre-correction, uh, diversion, distraction, um, you know, something called proximity technique, which is where you sort of, you know, float around the classroom and then float quite close to a student who might be about to kick off or whatever, um, and environmental scanning all the time to be able to keep, you know, a lid on what's happening in the classroom. Reactive discipline uh, occurs when the proactive isn't in place or if it isn't eff effective. And that happens when a situation is allowed to get out of control um, and 
that means that the intervention or the action that happens afterwards needs to be at a higher level um, and that can often happen in punitive ways like shouting or humiliation, sarcasm, kicking a kid out of class and so on and then you have a chair thrown across the room. Okay, thank you. Let's speak about adjustments and exclusions. What has your research shown as the relationship between the provision of adjustments and exclusion of students with disability? So that can be as simple as saying, like, the conflict um, and disengagement occur when a teacher might say, I just told you that. When a student with a language disorder or a student with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is characterised by low working memory, um, doesn't pick up on all the instructions and therefore doesn't know what to do. Um, saying, I just told you that and dismissing that student, and it's a miracle that they asked in the first place, um, that's when an adjustment is not being made. An adjustment is when, and particularly the way we prefer to do it, when we talk about universal principles and so on, is that we plan proactively. We know that there are certain students in our classroom who have those sorts of difficulties. So we put into place practices that help them. So simple things like having written instructions that are up on the board or you know, provided to a student, or if that student is, once you give a whole class instruction, you then go to that student and see whether they understand what's just been said. You don't wait for it to fail. Yeah. Am I correct in understanding that your research um, indicates to you a correlation as between non-provision of adjustments and exclusions? 100%. Okay. Now, I, I use the word uh, students, the phrase students in the grey zone, which are words you use in your statement. What are, who are students in the grey zone? What's that mean? So the kids in the grey zone are the ones who fall in between the boxes created by what we call categorical resource allocation methods. And I apologise to the interpreter for that one. Um, so you've been hearing all week about the way that funding, disability funding, is provided in schools. And it's typically category based. And I think you just heard before from a couple of guidance officers talking about the students with diagnoses that don't fit within those boxes. Those are students in the grey zone and that can happen either because their particular disability is not included, like for example, students with ADHD, or it can be students for whom their disability is not judged to be at the level, uh, the threshold needed for individually targeted funding. And that can be a student with developmental language disorder who has still has language disorder, but not, you know, severe enough to, and it has to be pretty severe, to uh, receive funding. Okay. Do I understand it that your view um, is that uh, many education providers in Australia still employ categorical resource allocation methods and, and these um, are used essentially to ring fence individually targeted support funding and resources? Yes. What's that mean? So ring fencing is basically, it, it is a way of keeping a lid on funding, which I don't disagree with. Um, you know, you do need to do that. Uh, you know, we can't bankrupt our education system or our governments. Um, so disability categories and you know, different criteria are used in order to work out, well, who gets that kind of funding? You heard earlier about um, funding that doesn't need all of that, where it's called census-based funding, which is where there's an allocation that's given to schools and you don't have to have a diagnosis for that. But you also heard that that gets used and not necessarily for um, those students. It can be used sometimes, I think, inappropriately to um, 
employ uh, senior staff. Um, it, a lot of the time it can be used for kind of, you know, general teacher aides and so on. It isn't necessarily used for the best, like the best way, which is to upskill teachers, release them from face-to-face -face teaching so that they have time to plan for the students in their class. Um, so there's actually a lot of money out there, but principals don't necessarily know that. Can, can I take you to, um, and I'll ask you to provide an example, you touched on this already, uh, of what your research has shown in terms of how behaviour incidents uh, can emerge where adjustments aren't provided, particularly students in this grey zone you speak on? Yes. Um, so the students that I'm talking about, um, they also happen to be uh, the ones that are most overrepresented in, um, you know, when you look at exclusion discipline statistics and so on. You know, these are the kids that you can see the most. Um, so... And the way that they get characterised is that they are, and I think as well because disability, their particular disability is not visible, um, often it, they are perceived as, like I said before, can't be bothered, don't want to do it, there's usually a reason why. And so they get in a lot of trouble for things like not following instructions um, or not doing their work. Um, now, the thing is that the reason that they may not be following instructions is because they have language processing difficulties. Um, so they may not comprehend what they're being told. They may have working memory difficulties. So they may hear the beginning of what you said and the end and not the middle part. Um, and in terms of not doing their work, it's often because it's too hard. Um, or if they have ADHD, effort is extremely difficult and they end up getting in trouble for that. Okay. Can you tell me, it's not necessarily the case, though, that outcomes would be better if they were in receipt of individually targeted funding? Uh, sadly, no. So there, you've heard this week about um, plenty of students who have had individually targeted funding. And on that particular case, um, I will tell you about a, a boy called Daniel. Um, that's a pseudonym. Uh, he was a boy in our longitudinal study. And in prep, his teacher said, oh, you know, there's something not right with Daniel. Um, but, you know, we can't get him verified. Uh, so he gets no support. And in the next year, it was basically the same story, uh, except they thought that he had speech language impairment. In the third year, so he was in grade two by that point, he did get verified with speech language impairment, but not a lot of support came with that. Grade three, he was then uh, verified with intellectual impairment or intellectual disability. Um, and that was done so that he would be able to get more funding. Now, during the time that this was going on, Daniel was put onto what's called an ICP or an individual curriculum plan. And uh, it was basically reset to prep. And there he stayed. And by uh, year four, his teacher said that she had no concerns now about Daniel because she knew that he would never be at the expected level of anyone else in his class. And so, no, we're all right with that. So okay. now this student did get funding and where he spent most of his time was either in the responsible thinking room or with a teacher aide on an iPad in a corridor outside the classroom or uh, at a table. He was constantly tailed by an adult. Um, he was doing things that we knew he, because we were doing assessments every year with the kids, 
uh, we knew that he could do far more than writing large letters in coloured pencil and a scrapbook. So as I understand the message you're seeking mm. to convey here through that example, uh, money won't fix it no. necessarily in and of itself um, mm. if the teachers aren't uh, able to and skilled enough to um, identify ways to deliver the curriculum in a different way that will assist the particular student. Yes. Okay. Um, and by that, you're not intending to be critical of teachers across the board. It's no. just a matter of wanting to ensure that teachers are given those skills. As, mm. Yes. Yes. I understand you accept that uh, teachers and principals can be under a significant amount of stress in the course of their work? Yes. Yes. And so it's not intended in a, a broad criticism in that sense? No. It's a, And that's one of the reasons that we talk about systemic reform which is that, you know, this is bigger than just individual teachers or principals. They're working within a system and, you know, in my evidence I talk about perverse incentives and badly created policy creates perverse incentives and people are people, they react to that. Um, so the answer is to change the policy. Okay. Um, just... To I'm going to I'm going to row 22 now of, of my notes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You've investigated to different <clears throat> approaches to funding and supporting students with a disability, and in in the course of that work, um, you've identified and this is in your statement, but perverse incentives regarding diagnosis and double C D funding issues and using exclusionary discipline to build a case around a child. Mm -hmm. On that last one, what do you mean by that? So one of the things, and I think the guidance officers did a really good job of talking about this, is that um, there's a bit of a push-pull from schools and the region and the centre um, where... In order to get funding, principals are of the view, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, that they have to inflate, that, you know, if if they don't, then the funding will be knocked down to a point that's negligible. Um, and so part of that is that they feel that they have to build a case and have evidence to support that case. And our suspension... Uh, is one of those pieces of evidence. So if you have a trail of an, an, a sort of, you know, evidence of a child that's having difficulty at school, well, um, that can go an off, a long way towards supporting your case and your claim for funding. Where that becomes a problem is when, um, and I'm not saying that that child doesn't need support, they do. Um, but where that becomes a problem is when that child is then suspended for things that other child, or children are not. Um, it also becomes a long-term problem because there are other strategies that are involved in that, one of which is the use of inflammatory hyperbolic language to describe children's behaviour. We heard earlier this week about uh, Sam deliberately kicking his teacher. Now, where'd that come from? So a five-year-old deliberately kicking their teacher in a knee that the teacher, you know, so there's the point that I'm making here is that the way that the behaviour gets described um, is used and is done so sometimes to create a case. The problem is that that case follows the child. So it has, it can have flow on adverse Effects, even if unintentional. Effects, absolutely. Yeah, even if entirely unintentional. Yes. Okay. So the the aim might be good, which is I need to get support to help this child, but the forward thinking and the big picture isn't there. As to um, exclusion, and we're talking formal exclusion here, and in Queensland we tend to call that. Sorry, in Queensland we call it ex exclusion. Some other states call it expulsion. <laughs> um, in your view, expulsion should only be used as a last resort and only after evidence-based educative 
responses have failed and after you know, relevant and effective reasonable adjustments have been implemented with fidelity. Is that correct? Um, actually, I use that for exclusionary discipline. I say that regarding exclusionary discipline more generally, not just expulsion. Okay, I'm sorry. So exclusionary discipline should only ever be used in that way. It shouldn't be used for minor incidents. It has serious ill effects that are long-lasting uh, and cumulative. Okay, so I just do want to be clear as to when you speak about this in um, paragraph 47 of your mm -hmm. statement, what you are talking about expulsions, yes? No. Not at all? Oh, well, I mean, that, yes, as okay, well. Okay, I'm trying to get the, the full <laughs> raft, okay? I'm talking Ex about suspension. I'm talking about um, exclusions, expulsions. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, your research has indicated to you that uh, suspensions... This is at row 27. Suspensions are most commonly used for, for minor, minor rule infractions. <clears throat> Do I have that correct? That's true. Um, things like being out of bounds. Um, earlier this week you heard about, uh, I believe it was Sam absconding. Um, so that can be recorded as being out of bounds. Um, things like incorrect uniform and not following instructions, like I mentioned before, um, low-level developmentally inappropriate, oh, sorry, appropriate transgressions, like talking in class, um, and disengaged behaviours like dawdling in the toilets uh, and missing class or not completing work. So those are actually the most common reasons for which a child is suspended um, and excluded, generally what ends up happening in the exclusion part of it is that there's a, an escalation that takes place. Okay. What, if anything, did your research um, indicate as to uh, whether suspension was typically the first response? It's not typically the, the first response, um, but I'd like to explain that because uh, there's more to the story. So typically, as I mentioned before, there's a pattern of es escalation um, where exclusionary discipline is applied to address minor behaviours, which is inappropriate to start with, but because those responses haven't achieved the desired outcome, so a consequence has been applied but the behaviour hasn't changed, um, the behaviour keeps occurring. And as I explained in my witness statement, that's because replacement behaviours are not taught. So, you know, you kick a kid out and you expect them to come back in and do something differently and they're not going to be able to. What ends up happening is that rather than revisiting and assessing both the relevance and the effectiveness of the response and figuring out, well, did that work? That's the part that tends not to happen. So it's just let's keep doing more of the same. And that's why looking at the incidence of repeat suspensions is so important because those are the kids. That's where you find the over the most over-representation of students with disability. So you have observed in your research a path of suspension, uh, re-suspensions sometimes yep. and a correlation then with exclusion. Yes. So in the sense of expulsion. Right, it's press repeat. Okay. Are you saying okay. that the ultimate suspension, that is removal from the school, whether for a specific period or permanently, is expressly put on the basis of what you describe as minor behaviours? It can be, yes. Not whether Absolutely it can, it can be. be. I, I rather thought you were saying that that's something that happens regularly. It does. Which is the uh, study that shows that? Uh, the one I can't talk about. 
So it's so there's um, no published study that supports that at the moment. Uh, yeah, there is. There's um, a tremendous amount of research internationally, which does show that. Um, it shows that suspension and exclusion actually precipitates. Um, it in increases antisocial behaviour. It. Uh, oh, no, it I'm sorry. I'm, I, 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 that, that I think may be a rather different point. I'm just trying to ascertain whether there is empirical evidence in Australia that suspension of a student child with disability will typically occur because of my, what you describe as minor behaviour as distinct from escalating and therefore perceived to be more serious behaviour. In Australia, no. Not okay. yet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, um, you expressed the, the view in, in your statement that exclusionary role, sorry, exclusionary discipline has no part to play in the early years of schooling. That's correct. Why do you hold that view? Because, well, first of all, young children don't understand it. So it's not something that they can possibly learn from. Uh, you heard Sam's mum earlier this week saying Sam didn't know what was going on, um, and they don't. So the most appropriate, like, so while I'm saying that it should not be used, I'm not saying that nothing should be done. Those are two separate things. Um, there are far better evidence-based approaches that are educative and will actually teach the child a replacement behaviour and also improve their self-regulation, which is often why they're getting in trouble in the first place. So, so can I summarise that, that um, it's not appropriate, in your view, for young children, um, given in part, their ability to self-regulate is still developing. Well, that's that's absolutely right. Um, the other reason is because... So you've got to think about what the lesson they're learning from that is. So whilst they might not understand it, they're still learning a lesson from it, which is, hey, if I do this, I might get to get out of that. So you're actually reinforcing the behaviour potentially. Um, okay. The other thing is that for a lot of the things that are happening at that age level, the things that they're getting in trouble for are actually developmentally appropriate. You know, we used to have a, you know, a system of infants um, and, and focusing on, well, these are the early years of school. These children are not fully developed yet and understanding that. And actually, the chair the other day pointed out that, you know, we don't hold children criminally responsible until they're 10 years of age, and that some are arguing that that should be 14. So for a five-year-old to eight, um, it's actually very, very difficult for those children. Okay. And what do you say is the role of applying a developmental lens over this? So... Applying a developmental lens is basically thinking about what has just happened and working out why it's happening, um, understanding why a child might have done whatever they've done. Um, so to explain that, um, in the first year of our longitudinal study, I spent a lot of time in prep year classrooms, which was great fun. And... The sad part about it was that I was able to pick very easily uh, which children would be the kinds of children we're talking about now. And those children were predominantly boys and they had poor self-regulation, poor spatial awareness. Um, you know, they were often later or if not already diagnosed with ADHD and, and other disabilities and they were spending a lot of time in time out and constantly getting in trouble for simple things that often they 
aren't yet able to really control. So they'd get in trouble, for example, by inadvertently hurting another child because they wanted to be first in line and some of these were bigger boys and, you know, pushing to get to the front of the line. Not, It's not the deliberate kind of action, um, but it gets construed in that way. Right. Can I summarise it in this way, in a hope not to do it injustice? Um, applying a developmental lens to exclusion means thinking sensibly and logically about what is and is not develop, developmentally appropriate and not punishing children for behaviours that are not unexpected for their age or developmental stage. Yes, I would. I wrote that, so I would agree with it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to claim ownership of it. Uh, but I, I am going to um, orient you now to row 31. 31. Um, through what, through your work, what have you formed views about in terms of the consequences of using such discipline in the early years of schooling? It has a tremendous impact. Uh, so children end up spending time out of school. They are like little sponges at that age, um, but they're also, you know, they don't understand what's going on. Uh, so they internalise very quickly. And, you know, all you have to do is ask a five-year-old what group um, they're in for reading uh, and what that means, and they'll be able to tell you. Um, so they, you know, they their developing self-concept ends up damaged uh, by this type of approach. But it's also the, the first few years of school are the most critical in their education development because they it's it's a stage where we talk about in particularly in relation to reading where we talk about um, learning to read because by grade three you are reading to learn if you don't consolidate the essential sort of um, key skills at that stage you may never develop that and we've already heard about a student who left school without being able to read and many of the boys in my behaviour school study weren't either. You describe a concept of cumulative continuity. That's a really complicated one but so bear with me. Um, okay so the cumulative part I think is fairly instructive but it's where there's a snowballing over time um, and the behaviour becomes transactional. So what that means is that you, a child comes into school and they are how they are and depending on the environment that they come into and how that then shapes them, they either, you know, that can set them on a positive trajectory or a negative one. And the good thing is that the next classroom could help shift them back but if they have a series of, of negative um, experiences, that trajectory can be very dire indeed. All right. Um, I, I want to turn, please, to um, the question of data. Which number is this? Um, 37, please. Uh -huh. um, the lack thereof, I understand, to be an issue close to your heart. Yes. All right. If you had a wish list for the data that each state was required to keep, what would it be and, and <clears throat> why would it help us? Well, it's not about which, you know, what they're required to keep because... Our, um, our education providers are actually, well, particularly the, the government ones, are data rich. So they have tremendous amounts of data. They just don't make it public. And if you don't make it public, then we can't see what's really happening. And we have no idea who is being affected and how, or how to, how to fix it. Um, so my wish is that we 
it would probably be the Commonwealth Government that would need to make this happen. Um, but I would like to see Australia have complete consistency and transparency between um, our different sectors and um, and states, <clears throat> and that we have a a database um, that's publicly available, like the Office of Edu uh, Special Education Programs in the United States, so that we can actually look at what's really happening. And the types of data that I would want to see specifically in relation to you know, exclusionary discipline is disaggregated data so that we can not just look at whether students with disability are overrepresented um, or boys are overrepresented, uh, but that we can look at patterns within the data um, and also that we can look at something called intersectionality, which is work out, okay, because you can have, um, when we look at data, we, we look at Indigenous and we look at disability and we look at in care and multiple other categories, but it's actually possible to be in all those three. So it's actually really important to disentangle those so that we can really then see who is most affected. So is it actually kids with a disability or is it Indigenous kids or is it Indigenous kids with a disability? And look at that. And in Australia, we... One of the reasons, going back to the Chair's um, question before, one of the reasons that we don't have um, the type of research evidence here that we need is because we don't have access to that kind of data. In the United States, they have been re researching disproportionality um, for 60 years. In 1968, they first started talking about it and saying, hmm, there's a problem here. And I think I'm one of the only people um, who has published on the overrepresentation of Indigenous kids in special schools and support classes. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to get that data. Thank you. Can I take you to, to row 41? And um, um, touch on the topic here. May I, may I ask a question first that relates to something that you've um, covered in that area, and that's research into the failure at school uh, for children with disability into the prison pipeline. Uh, have you done research on, or sorry, perhaps I should be more accurate, failure at school juvenile justice involvement and then the prison pipe pipeline. Have you done research in that area or know of data or research in that area that would be useful to us? Thank you for your question, Commissioner Atkinson. Yes, I have. Um, uh, in 2009, <clears throat> um, some of my research hit the Australian titled Special Schools of Fast Track to Prison. Um, and what that came from was we were looking at <clears throat> the enrolment data in New South Wales because actually New South Wales is one of the most transparent states. They publish a lot of data. Um, <clears throat> you can't get everything that you need, but it's they're still pretty good. Um, and what we found was that there appears to be a graduating kind of effect where students will go into what's called behaviour schools, which are special schools for students with disruptive behaviour, and there's a spike in enrolments at around age 13. Um, but then when we looked at enrolments in juvenile justice special schools, it was almost an identical pattern. Uh, we also knew from our research in uh, behaviour schools that quite a number of the students that were in our study uh, ended up in juvenile detention. Some of them would, mid-interview, 
in a school that is sitting right across the street from a juvenile detention centre, um, great planning, but uh, a student there said to me, he was 13, and when we asked him, you know, hey, what's what's going to happen if you don't change your behaviour? He went, I'm going to end up in there, like this person, that person, this person. So there is a graduation, uh, and when that uh, study came out in the Australian, I was contacted by the head of research in the Department of Juvenile Justice in New South Wales saying, where did you get your data? Because we know this is happening and we can't get that data. So um, there are... There is a pattern there, most definitely. I'm actually talking about prior to them ending up in a behaviour school. Ah. Uh, you can see that children who've got to that stage are likely to have the sort of antisocial behaviour that will lead them into juvenile justice and prison. But more, uh, you were talking about children that you could see even in the preschool stage. Um, we're going to be the ones to get into trouble. That's the kind of research I guess I'm talking about. Much earlier on, before the school failure happens, the factors that lead to school failure and then that inevitable progression. So that's the whole reason that um, we put the longitudinal study together. Mm -hmm. The boys in the behaviour schools, our interviews with them were um, kind of had a retrospective longitudinal approach. We were really interested in their mainstream school history. Mm. And overwhelmingly, they talked about never receiving the support that they needed. Um, they talked about when we asked them when they started disliking school, the majority of them said kindergarten to year two. They talked about not being able to read um, and getting in trouble for things like throwing a chair across a classroom because of frustration at not being able to read. Um, so that's why we started this longitudinal study because I wanted to know where those cracks are and how these kids fall into them. And earlier this year we published a paper which looks at I guess, those cracks uh, and looks at in, in respect to reading. And so we looked at 118 of the children in our longitudinal study for whom we had all data, and we looked at their reading performance uh, from grade one through to grade three. And overwhelmingly, the kids that we're talking about here they were in a group that we called our persistently below average. There were 26 of them who were in that group from grade one all the way through to grade three. But that's also a little bit misleading because not only were they persistently below average, but they got much worse over time. And part of that was because they were not receiving evidence-based reading intervention support all they were getting were things like behaviour plans and wobble chairs or mm. some teacher aid time to, you know, hover over them. Mm. Thank you. I guess my interest in this has come from 20 years as a judge, always getting people way too late for that kind of intervention. Um, so hence my interest in any research you've done on those early years. Thank mm. you. Uh, Professor Farrett Graham, I'm going to take you to row 41, which is about um, teacher teacher workload. Mm. Now, at a par paragraph 149 of your statement, you list a number of um, underlying factors driving the high representation of students with disability being subjected being subject to ex exclusionary discipline. Um, do you see a correlation between the intensification in teacher workloads and students with disability being subject to exclusionary discipline? Yes, I do. Um, so as I've written in my 
uh, in the written statement, I've said that increases in the use of exclusionary discipline is happening mostly for the want of a better response, um, as many teachers and principals do not know what else to do um, because the toolkit has been exhausted and likely they are too. So I absolutely do acknowledge that. Um, I've met some wonderful teachers and principals, especially you know the ones that are uh, that are coming and doing um, postgraduate study with us. They're just great people. So this is not about bad people doing bad things. It's about people who are working within a system that isn't always conducive to them doing the best thing. Um, one of my key concerns, which we may get to towards the end, is that the intensification of teachers' work and the relentless focus on, you know, some headline elements um, of education and how that's contributed to the use of exclusionary discipline, uh, things like, as well, things like exemptions and you know, making sure kids don't participate in NAPLAN and so on. Um, yeah. I'll ask you for your additional reflections on that topic now rather than wait to the end, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so in that, that's in relation to a statement that I made that um, sus rising suspension and exclusion rates should uh, be interpreted to indicate the overall health of the education system and a reflection of the quality of teaching practice and inclusive practice. And I say that because um, I fundamentally believe that our system needs reorientation. Um, our educators are being driven to achieve certain outcomes. And as we know, what is measured is what counts. Those outcomes are not bad in and of themselves. I mean, who can argue with better literacy and numeracy outcomes? They are critically important, but they, are, they can't be achieved at the expense of everything else. And the problem is in Australia, because we have a competitive system, because we do have proxy um, sort of league tables, you know, literacy and numeracy is being measured and compared and principals are being punished for poor outcomes in in relation to that. So the problem then becomes when a principal is told that they can't list student wellbeing as a school improvement target or goal, that everything has to be about literacy, numeracy. And... The issue, though, is you have heard earlier this week from um, Dr. De Bruin and Associate Professor Pode about something called multitude systems of support. And the key point that I want to make in relation to that is that education is extremely complex and teaching and learning is extremely complex as well. It's also interrelated. So engagement and learning and behaviour are all tied in together. So you can't just focus on one and not also focus on the elements that are protective of it and predictive of it. And underneath all of that, sitting underneath all of that, is the quality of teaching. So you need to be paying attention to the academics, but you also need to be paying attention to social, emotional well-being, and you need to be paying attention to behaviour. And that's what multitude systems of support does. Can you just give me a minute, please? Excuse me, commissioners. It's okay. always fatal to take a minute because then I'll ask a question, which I'm now about to do. Where <laughs> is an example of the practice that would overcome the difficulties that you've pointed to? Is there somewhere in Australia where it works? If so, where, where do we look? Okay, so actually there are places where things are working. What you're looking for, though, doesn't really exist, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So what you are more likely to find 
is it working within individual classrooms, but not necessarily on a school-wide and definitely not on a system-wide basis. So let me tell you about this amazing teacher, Mrs Kay, who had multiple students with a disability in her class when I observed when they were in grade three, I think it was, and Mrs Kay was the most on-fire teacher. She had boys in her class who had been described to us every single year, red flagged by their teachers every year. I could not tell who they were in her class. She did not have a teacher's aide. She was she had this magic triangle and was very good at behaviourism, um, but she was lovely. So there are absolutely these processes can work, but we need everybody singing on the same page, singing from the same song sheet, the same sorts of high-quality practices happening everywhere. It should not be, as someone said earlier this week, a lottery. How many school teachers are there in Queensland? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. It's probably about 50,000. How do you get 50,000 Mrs K's? Haha. <laughs> well, that's a really good question. And Thank you. I, I think that is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a challenge because, you know, when I was doing um, my research in New South Wales, so that's our biggest system in Australia. And so they have over 2,200 schools, over 2,200 principals, obviously, 90,000 some odd teachers and that was a challenge that that department talked about all the time about how do we get this monumental edifice to be working in that way and it's not easy. There are some really good people within our departments who are doing the best that they can. I think Associate Professor Pogue made a really very important comment yesterday about the electoral cycle and what that does. When I was doing that research in New South Wales, I had um, senior people within the department say to me that there are certain things that they do not work on because it's don't talk about the war and where some ministers will come in and say, give me an initiative, I need an initiative, I need an announceable. So sometimes these intractable, difficult problems don't get solved because they're not pretty. And they're hard. I agree, they're hard. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Professor Graham, your statement does set out in, in some length recommendations that you make to the Commission. We're very grateful for that. Um, be, before I finish up my questions, I, I want to ask you, and I'm taking you to row 43 here about the dangers of a zero tolerance approach to perceived misbehaviour. <clears throat> okay, so the term zero tolerance is often invoked and usually at a political level. Um, you know, when a minister says we take a zero tolerance approach and so on. But what zero tolerance actually means, and sometimes I wonder whether they realise it when they say it, is it was a deliberate policy that was, it began in the 1990s in the US. Now, remember that, the US, where we have gun cultures and, and gang cultures and the types of behaviours that happen over there are far more severe than what happens here. And the prevailing theory at the time was based on something from policing and criminology, which was this broken windows theory, which was, look, if you, if you manage behaviour at the lowest level and you keep control of it there, then, you know, you won't end up like the little broken windows, you won't end up with, you know, anarchy and mayhem. The problem with what happened was that exclusionary discipline was the approach used to respond. And that has, as I've mentioned multiple times, all sorts of problems with it. You also heard this week about the New South Wales, um, when Mr Potter 
was speaking about their policy, which was any form of violence, you know, no matter how minor or what the situation was, that results in a suspension. It's kind of mandated. It's a similar sort of thing. So it causes enormous problems. And there are so many stories from the US where children have done incredibly minor things like pick up a stick and pretend it's a gun at, you know, when they're five years old. And we all did that. Um, and I can understand why in the United States that might be a little bit more uh, problematic than it is here. But that student then getting suspended for doing something like that. So over years, they've had this enormous escalation in exclusionary discipline. And for a long, all of that period of time, you've had brilliant researchers like Rush, Russell Skiba, for example, who have looked at who's affected by that. And the reality is when you drill down into the data, we actually have our most vulnerable children who are affected by it. So over in the US, thank goodness, uh, in 2014, the Obama administration um, couldn't keep ignoring that data and that empirical evidence anymore. And so they put out uh, a set of guiding principles um, the Office of Civil Rights warned schools uh, about their civil rights obligations because of the enormous overrepresentation of African American students. We have an enormous overrepresentation of Indigenous kids, but our governments are doing nothing about that. So basically the dangers of a zero tolerance approach is that it doesn't take in, there's no flexibility involved, there's no thinking about why did this happen, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. You know, we, we talk about behaviour being a form of communication. We talk about using a functional behavioural assessment or even, you know, a sort of proxy of that, which is to try and figure out what happened and what that behaviour means. But zero tolerance takes all of that away. And, of course, the students who are most mostly um, badly affected are students with disability, Indigenous students and kids in care. Thank you, Professor Graham. Commissioners? Thank you. Uh, perhaps I might start with Commissioner Mason. Do you have any questions? Oh, I could listen to you for... <laughs> For another hour, but thank you so much for coming today um, and sharing uh, your research and findings, and um, but also drawing on other uh, work that's happened in other places. Um, like uh, Commissioner Atkins, I'm interested in this uh, connection between the experiences of school and of expulsion and juvenile justice mm -hmm. and uh, adult prisons. Um, I'm also really interested in the connection of uh, uh, mental health um, yep. and the connection to psychosocial disability and the vulnerability that happens outside um, of schools and that that life experience. Um, uh, but the question I'd like to ask you is um, there's been a significant amount of work that's happened over the last uh, 10 years in closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people across a range of areas, and education has always been one of the fundamental areas uh, of um, change. And uh, we are now in the era of evidence-based policies and programs. Um, and, uh, and there's a focus with the current uh, national agreement on data helping to guide. Mm. Uh, and it is a national approach, which is really fantastic to all governments. And in your experience, um, what would you say to the uh, the likelihood of that being able to be done in a way where we would be able to draw on consistent data across all those states and territories, or do you think that, given the current circumstances, uh, we have an enormous challenge around the data that we've been talking about this afternoon? <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Um, I, I got very excited when you mentioned the closing the gap targets and report. Um, 
to answer your question in the first instance, no, we don't have the data that we need to to do that properly. And it's my absolute fervent hope that this Royal Commission can make that happen. Um, my second point, and the reason that I got so excited when you mentioned the Closing the Gap report, was that I could not believe when I was looking at that report recently that <clears throat> attendance is a goal, right? And it's one of the goals that we have not been able to make any progress on in the last 10 years. Meanwhile, suspension and exclusion is not mentioned at all in the report and it's not reducing those things is not a goal. Now, the Indigenous kids that I have been speaking to in the last year um, have said to me, it's a bit stupid, eh, when you get suspended for wagging. And they're 100% right. We, How is it that we've got these goals, but at the same time we have practices that are pretty rife that completely contradict those goals? So if I could change something, it would be that every state, uh, every sector, it has that as a goal. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Atkinson? No, thank you. Commissioner Galbally? Um, I would just like to ask um, whether there is a jurisdiction that you know of internationally where suspensions and exclusions um, mean that the school, the assessment of the school um, is affected by the numbers and rates of um, suspensions and exclusions and whether the school principal and the school would be assessed accordingly? <laughs> um, I think that's one of my recommendations. But, um, but there's a tremendous amount happening in the United States, um, especially since the 2014 uh, guiding principles that were put out by the Obama administration. And I am so excited that despite those being rescinded uh, by the current administration, um, the, the public school systems that have implemented reforms are continuing to implement reforms. And one of the reasons that they're doing that is because they're seeing success from them. So um, Chicago Public Schools, for example, is one, um, and there's also California. So just last year, the Californian governor, um, who I believe is a Democrat, but anyway, uh, the Californian government he is, and his name further is further reforms. Newsom. That's right. <laughs> um, so essentially what they started doing in the beginning was they removed um, schools' ability to use exclusionary discipline for children uh, in the early years of school. And in primary school, they, re they removed completely or banned the use of exclusionary discipline for willful defiance. Um, they're now considering banning the use of exclusionary discipline for willful defiance in total. And one of the reasons that they're starting to do that is because the other responses that they've implemented, multi-tiered systems of support, restorative practice, diversionary strategies, teaching students using social-emotional learning so that they can self-regulate, use their words, so on. All of these are proving really successful. They have not only driven down enormously their suspension and exclusion rates, but their school connectedness measures have improved. There's studies coming out that are showing that academic uh, results are improving as well. So they haven't gone quite with the punitive 
uh, response. But on that front, I'm sure you've heard of No Child Left Behind, which people normally talk about in really terrible ways. No Child Left Behind actually resulted in some good outcomes for students with disability. Initially, it led to greater exclusion and greater segregation. But once the federal government figured out what was going on, what they did was create something called priority subgroups, um, priority groups, and outcomes for those students, students with disability being one, were measured. And schools were accountable for them. That doesn't happen here. Not in the way that it needs to. And it was public too. So it's a little bit sort of not quite an answer to your question, but that's what has been successful. Very valuable answer to my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Graham, for your evidence and your 83-page statement, which we uh, have all read completely. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving evidence. Um, <coughs> Dr. Melifont, does that mean that uh, we adjourn until 10 a.m. Brisbane time tomorrow, Friday? It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. In that case, we shall adjourn. The Royal Commission is adjourned.